Introduction to Hosea from the Holy Bible with Original Notes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hosea from the Holy Bible with Original Notes by Thomas Scott. The twelve remaining prophecies have long been considered as one book. It is thought that St. Stephen referred to this arrangement when, quoting a passage from Amos, he says, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Acts 7 verse 42, and it is certain that in the first ages of Christianity both Jews and Christians numbered up the books of the Old Testament according to it. This may help to show what those books were to which Christ and his apostles referred as the scriptures and the oracles of God. The writers of this part of scripture are generally called the minor prophets, not that their writings were inferior in excellency or authority to the larger works of the other prophets, but merely on account of their brevity. They do not seem to be placed exactly after the order in which the prophets delivered them. Nine of them prophesied before the captivity, three prophesied after the Jews were returned from Babylon, and some of the former were as early or more so than the prophet Isaiah, especially Jonah, who evidently preceded all the others. As to the rest, the various schemes formed, and the different opinions held by very learned men, and the slender grounds on which in some cases they rest their opinions, shows that it is a subject of more difficulty than use. The dates affixed to each prophecy and its several parts must suffice here. It may be supposed that these prophets, and many who wrote nothing, were eminent and useful preachers of righteousness to their own generations, and perhaps some of them did more service in their own time than those who have left more behind them for the benefit of posterity, at least the Lord generally dispenses his gifts and services in this manner. Hosea, whose prophecy we now enter upon, exercised his sacred office for a great many years. He predicted the captivity of the ten tribes long before it arrived, yet he probably lived to witness its near approach. He is supposed to have been of the kingdom of Israel, though his prophecies frequently relate to Judah also. His style is remarkably concise, sententious, and unconnected, though some parts are particularly pathetic, animated, and sublime. His general scope was to convince his people of their exceeding sinfulness, and to warn them by the terror and lead them by the goodness of God to repentance. His prediction of events which soon took place are numerous, but those relating to the state of Israel and Judah for many ages, the conversion of the Gentiles and the future restoration of the Jews, are peculiarly distinct and striking. They coincide with those of the other prophets, and the extraordinary fulfilment of several both proves the divine inspiration of the writer, and gives assurance that the rest will in due time be accomplished. Considering the brevity of this prophecy, few parts of the Old Testament are more fully attested by quotations or clear references in the New. Compare chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and chapter 2, verse 23, with Romans 9, verses 25 and 26, and 1 Peter 2, verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 6, with Matthew 9, verse 13. Chapter 10, verse 8, with Luke 23, verse 30. And Revelation 6, verse 16. Chapter 11, verse 1, with Matthew 2, verse 15. Chapter 13, verse 14, with 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55. Very strong language has been used by some learned men on the corrupt state in which the original text of the Minor Prophets in general, and of Hosea in particular, has been sent down to us, and abundant corrections, some on but slender authority, others purely conjectural. Some where they might seem to render the sense more clear, others where, to me at least, they appear to render it more obscure, have been proposed. But this method, if freely encouraged, is a desperate remedy. It tends to add to and take from the word of God, and to substitute the conjectures of men in the place of his infallible oracles. In a few instances, with great caution and sobriety, on the United authority of manuscripts and versions, a slight alteration may be admissible, but in general it is probable that the humble, diligent, and pious student of Scripture will find that the text, as it now stands, contains in every part an important and instructive meaning. Industry, with earnest prayer, in endeavouring to understand the sacred oracles in their present state, would perhaps do more to render the meaning of them intelligible, explicit, and impressive, than all the labour which is taken to correct and improve the text, and if at last a few passages remained obscure or ambiguous, this would by no means be of such bad consequence as conjectural alterations, or alterations on dubious authority. The translation of this prophecy likewise has been much complained of, and perhaps some passages are less exactly and clearly rendered than usual. 
but it is no easy matter to give an unexceptionable version to so concise an ancient book which is on many accounts peculiarly difficult and it is very doubtful whether all things considered a better translation could at least be made than that which we already possess at least such attempts in this and other instances do not appear to have been very successful End of introduction. Chapter 1 of Hosea from the Holy Bible with original notes by Thomas Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An account of the prophet and of the times when he lived, verse 1. At God's command and to expose the idolatry of Israel, he takes a wife of whoredoms and calls his children by names expressive of the judgments that were coming on his people, verses 2 to 9. The increase and restoration of Judah and Israel under one head, verses 10 and 11. Verse 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Verse 3. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived, and bare him a son. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Verse 5. And it shall come to pass at that day, that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 6. And she conceived again, and bare him a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Verse 7. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Verse 8. Now when she had weaned Lo-Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Verse 9. Then said God, Call his name Lo-Ami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Verse 11. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Notes verse 1. This is the general title of the book. Hosea wrote the word that came to him from the Lord. His name is the same as Joshua or Jesus, except as these are compounded with the first syllable of the word Jehovah. It signifies salvation. All the kings of Judah that succeeded each other during Hosea's ministry are mentioned, but Jeroboam of Israel alone, under whose reign he began to prophesy, for after Jeroboam's death the affairs of Israel fell into the utmost confusion. See notes 2 Kings 19 verse 21 and 15 verse 8. If we suppose that the prophet exercised his ministry for a few of the last years of Jeroboam and of the first of Hezekiah, we shall find that he laboured in the work nearly seventy years and must have lived to a very great age. No information is given of the time in which he delivered any of his predictions. Verses 2 and 3. The prophet was called to enter on his prophetical office in a very remarkable manner. When he was, as it seems, a very young man, he was commanded by the Lord to marry a wife of whoredoms, one notorious for that vice, and whose children would be considered as children of whoredoms. This was intended to be an emblem of the Lord's dealings with the idolatrous Israelites whom he had espoused to himself, and accordingly Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. It hath been much disputed whether this was done in reality or in vision, or whether it were anything more than a parable that he spake to the people. But it seems to be taking an unauthorized liberty with Scripture to explain narrative into vision or parable without absolute necessity or any intimation of it in the text. If we consider it as a reality, many difficulties remain to be obviated. 
It is argued that it would have been inconsistent with the prophet's character to marry a notoriously bad woman, and therefore some have conjectured that she was previously reformed, as Rahab the harlot had been before she was married to Salmon. Others imagine that she bore a good character when the prophet married her, but afterwards became a wife of whoredoms, and her children were brought under the suspicion of being children of whoredoms, and this is more plausible than the former, which by no means accords to the thing signified. But perhaps it may be shown that it was not unlawful or immoral for the prophet to marry a licentious woman on such an occasion. Some restrictions were laid upon the priests in these respects, but he was not concerned in them. Gomer was an Israelite and not included in the prohibitions of intermarrying with Gentiles. The rule in the New Testament of believers marrying only in the Lord was doubtless always obligatory as to the spirit of it, in ordinary cases, because most important consequences depended upon it. But, like the laws against the marriages of near relations, though generally and highly expedient, it cannot be deemed of immutable and indispensable obligation, for cases may be imagined in which it must be violated, or other moral laws of God be broken. The express command of God would suffice to authorize any deviations from ordinary rules which were not of immutable and moral obligation, and it is impossible that he should actually command an immoral action, though he might command what otherwise would have been wrong for a man to do, as the extirpation of the Canaanites, men, women, and children, so that it might not only be lawful for the prophet thus to marry, but his bounden duty, and to bear the heavy cross that it would lay on him. As the Israelites were idolatrous in Egypt before their national espousals to the Lord at Mount Sinai, as well as afterwards, so that they were, through their successive generations unto him, as a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, it would form a more affecting picture of God's unmerited goodness and unwearied patience, and of their perverseness and ingratitude by which they grieved and wearied him out, and dishonoured him, if we take it literally, than if we adopt any other interpretation of it. A man who had a wife that both before and after marriage was guilty of incontinence would be ready to look upon her children with suspicion, and to consider them as children of whoredoms, and others would be apt to think the same. This was the case of the Lord respecting the people of Israel, and it will perhaps afterwards appear that the conduct of the prophet exactly pictured that of God to Israel with respect to his past and present and predicted future dealings with that favoured but ungrateful nation. Verses 4 and 5. See notes 2 Kings chapter 10 verses 29 to 31. Gomer, the name of Hosea's wife, signifies consumption. This might in general denote the ruin of the nation for their idolatries, and the names which God commanded the prophet to give her children referred to the different gradations by which that ruin would come upon them. Jezreel was the city where Jehu smote the family of Ahab. The name signifies the seed of God, or the arm of God, or scattered by God, as seed is when sown. Jehu had executed judgment on Ahab's family and was recompensed for that service by the continuance of the kingdom in his family to the fourth generation, but his subsequent conduct evinced that he was actuated by selfish motives in all that he did. The ambition, cruelty, and hypocrisy of which he was then guilty were to be avenged on his house after their subsequent idolatry and iniquity had ripened them for this destruction, and then the kingdom would speedily cease from the house of Israel." This was predicted towards the close of the reign of Jeroboam, the grandson of Jehu, whose son Zechariah was soon murdered by Shalom, who usurped the throne, and from that time the history of the kingdom of Israel contains little else than conspiracies, murders, and usurpations, till it was subverted by the Assyrians, and the people were scattered of God through the various provinces of the Assyrian Empire. Perhaps some fatal battle was afterwards fought in the valley of Jezreel, in which the Assyrians break the bow, or destroy the military force of the kingdom of Israel. Verses 6 and 7. The daughter which Gomer next bare has been considered as an emblem of the enfeebled state of Israel after the fall of Jehu's family. Her name signifies not having received mercy, and implied that God would finally cast off the kingdom of Israel as a separate people, and no more show them the special mercy that he bears to his chosen inheritance but at the same time he promised to have mercy on Judah and to save them by the Lord their God, and not by the weapons of war. Some explain this of the deliverance of Judah from the Assyrian invasion by the miraculous destruction of Sennacherib's army. 
others of their return from captivity, by the Lord's powerfully inclining the heart of Cyrus to release them. But we should not lose sight of the great salvation by the Lord their God, when he was manifested in the flesh to effect by himself that spiritual redemption of which all the temporal deliverances of his people were no more than types and shadows. Of this salvation all the prophets wrote, the Jewish nation was continued in possession of their privileges till this horn of salvation was raised up among them. His victories were obtained not by bow or sword, but by his precious blood and powerful grace, and he will at last save the Jews and recover them from their present dispersions, for which purpose they are evidently reserved from age to age a separate people, whilst the Israelites have either been incorporated among them or among the Gentiles. Verses 8-10 to 10. Lo, Ami signifies not my people, as Israel had not sought or obtained mercy, God would no longer own them as his people. They would be left to renounce entirely his worship, and he would utterly cast them out of his special protection. Yet he would not break his promise made to their fathers. The numbers of the Israelites would still be as the sand of the sea. Vast multitudes of their tribes would be joined to the Jews, or converted along with them to Christ, and the innumerable millions of the Gentiles, that should become the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, would be indeed the true Israel and the seed of Abraham, as united to that one seed to whom the promises were made. So that in the places where it had heretofore been said that the inhabitants were not God's people, there would be many addressed as the children of the living God. Marginal reference. Verse 11. This may refer to the union of the Israelites with the Jews, who came up under Zerubbabel after the captivity. They were not divided as before, but appointed themselves one head or captain and ruler over them all. Or it may relate to the conversion of the Israelites as well as the Jews to Christ in the primitive times, or rather to that future period when the Jews and all the Israelites that are incorporated with them shall gather together and submit to Christ as their head of authority, direction, protection, and influence, and so come up out of the land of their captivity. For as the scattering of the people by the Lord hath been great and long, so the day of their being gathered from their dispersions shall be very glorious, which seems to be intended by the day of Jezreel. Practical Observations it would seldom be expedient, and sometimes it would not be lawful for us to exercise all that tenderness, compassion, and liberal kindness to those who grossly violate their relative and social engagements, which the Lord shows to us, after all our ingratitude, unfaithfulness, and misbehaviour to him. But he hath provided a method in which to display the honour of his justice and holiness, whilst his grace abounds to the chief of sinners." We should be ready to bear any cross in our persons, or in domestic and relative life, which the Lord pleases to appoint for us. He has a right to our implicit submission, our sharpest trials are far less than our deservings, and he can make up all losses to us, and comfort us in the most disquieting circumstances. That situation may be safe and easy to us when the Lord appoints it for us, which would have been intolerable and perilous if we had thrust ourselves into it and when we are obedient to God's command we may trust our characters with him and venture all consequences, even though we act contrary to the general sentiments of mankind in ordinary cases. We should any of us be broken and wearied out, with half that perverseness from others with which we try the patience and grieve the spirit of our God, nor can any event in life sufficiently illustrate his long-suffering and mercy to his people and their base and ungrateful conduct to him. But though the upright soul who loathes and mourns over his sins may still hope in that mercy which he is conscious of having abused, yet let the proud, hypocritical, and hardened rebel beware. His specious and hollow services will have their reward, but his pride and hypocrisy will meet with their merited punishment, and though avarice, ambition, and iniquity may for a time advance a man's family, or even promote the prosperity of a nation, yet they will at length bring down a load of vengeance which will scatter or sink them in infamy and ruin. The Lord's mercy is infinite and everlasting towards them that fear him, but it hath its limits in respect of impenitent sinners and guilty nations. The time approaches when he will no more have mercy on them for ever, and dreadful will be the case of those who shall not have obtained mercy when death shall summon them to God's tribunal. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He saves them by his own mercy, truth, and power from guilt and sin, from Satan and this present world, and from all their enemies, that they may serve him in righteousness and true holiness before him all the days of their lives, and they need fear no dangers, 
who have God for their shield and exceeding great reward. Though many of his professed people have been cast off, and he would no more be their God, yet the number of his true Israel can never be known. Blessed be his name, that in our land, of which it might once have been said, Ye are not my people, it may now be said of numbers, Ye are the children of the living God. May it be truly said of the writer and every reader of these observations. Let us then join ourselves to his worshippers, and enlist under the banner of our appointed head, that with one accord we may leave the land of our captivity, and march forward to the Canaan above, celebrating as we proceed the glory of our Redeemer, the greatness of our deliverance, our invaluable privileges, and our joyful prospect. And let us pray for the approach of that glorious day, when the scattered Jews shall gather themselves to Christ, and be again numbered amongst his seed, his true Israel, and when there shall be one Lord, and his name one, through all the nations of the earth. Chapter 2 Israel is convicted of aggravated idolatry and base ingratitude, and threatened with heavy judgments, verses 1 to 13. God allures them with promises of reconciliation, and of many blessings to them and to others by their means, verses 14 to 23. Verse 1 Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama. Verse 2 Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. Verse 3. Lest I strip her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Verse 4. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. Verse 5. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that convinced them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers, that gave me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and make a wall, that she shall not find her paths. Verse 7. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. Verse 8. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Verse 9. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Verse 10. And now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. Verse 11. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Verse 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Verse 13. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgat me, saith the Lord. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably to her. Verse 15. And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. Verse 17, For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Verse 18, And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of the heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword, and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. Verse 19, And I will betroth thee unto me for ever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. Verse 20, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. Verse 22, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Verse 23, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, 
and they shall say, Thou art my God. Notes Verse 1 God had promised that, where it had been said to them, Ye are not my people, there it should be said, Ye are the children of the living God, which has been explained of the calling of the Gentiles and the dispersed Israelites into the church, and the Jews are here exhorted to acknowledge them as brethren, and to call them Ami, or my people, and Ruhama, or having obtained mercy. They were required to treat all as brethren and sisters who had obtained mercy and were become God's people, and to congratulate them on their admission to this happy estate. It may also intimate that when Israel should be cast off from being God's peculiar people, there would still be found a remnant to which his servants might thus address themselves at the time when the prophet wrote, and when the Jewish nation was rejected after the coming of Christ. Some expositors interpret this of the general restoration of the Jewish nation, but St. Paul evidently quotes the passage referred to as a prediction of the calling of the Gentiles. Verses 2 to 5. While the servants of God were directed to own as brethren the converted Gentiles and the restored of Israel, they were called on to plead in the name of God with their mother, or the church and nation of Israel. When the prophets protested against idolatry and the pious remnant separated from the idolaters, though their kings, princes, and priests, and the bulk of the nation were of that number, they then pleaded with their mother. When Christ and his apostles severely reproved the chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, and the nation in general, and foretold their rejection and the calling of the Gentiles, they pleaded with their adulterous mother, and took the Lord's part against her, and by encouraging penitent publicans, harlots, Samaritans, and Gentiles, they said to their brethren, Ami, and to their sisters, Ruhama. It might be deemed undutiful for sons to plead against their mother, yet the honour of their God and Father on this occasion required it. She was therefore to be reminded that the Lord no longer considered her as his wife, or himself as her husband, and that he would proceed to execute judgment on her unless she repented and reformed. This was expressed by putting away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, etc., and it implied a command to put away all the idols from the land, and to avoid whatever might tempt them or others to that crime, and to pull down, as it were, the idols that were set up in their hearts. If this were not done immediately, the Lord threatened that he would strip her naked, etc. That is, he would deprive the people of all their honourable distinctions and desirable advantages, and reduce them to the most abject, contemptible, and miserable condition, similar to their bondage in Egypt, in the infancy of the nation, and would leave them as in a wilderness, to perish with hunger and thirst. Nor would he show mercy to their children, for they were born of idolaters, brought up in idolatry, and even dedicated to idols, and therefore God regarded them as children of whoredoms. And indeed what else could have been expected of them when their mother had been so abandoned as to run into the most shameful practices? For the people in general ascribed their temporary plenty and prosperity to the bounty of their idols, and were emboldened to go on in the abominable worship of them, by abounding in everything which they could abuse to sensuality. Thus the heathens used to worship one imaginary deity as the giver of their corn, another as the giver of their wine, or of their fruit, etc., and in the festivals kept in honour of these idols they ran into the most shameful excesses. By lovers are meant, in the first place, the idols with which the Israelites committed spiritual fornication, Jeremiah 3 verse 1, and then the idolatrous nations whose alliance they courted, and in order to it practised their idolatries. Loath. There seems no sufficient evidence for interpreting this chapter exclusively of the ten tribes as many expositors do. Verses 6 and 7. The Lord did not intend to cast off all the seed of Israel, and therefore, speaking of the nation in general, he declared his purpose of keeping them from sinking into universal idolatry. Whilst the infatuated harlot was bent on following after her lovers, he was resolved to make a thorn hedge across her road, through which she could not pass without greatly tearing herself, nay, to build a wall which she could not get over to find her paths, so that, though she attempted to follow her lovers, she should not overtake them, etc. That is, the Lord would so punish his people by heavy judgments as to preserve them from total idolatry, so that, whilst numbers would perish, a remnant would be cured of that sin. When the ten tribes were carried into Assyria, and the Jews to Babylon, neither their idols nor their idolatrous allies could do them any good, and not being able to overtake them, or to find protection and deliverance from them, they would be convinced of their folly in forsaking the living God for dead idols, their first husband for these worthless lovers, 
and so coming to themselves they would be led to return home, to repent, to seek reconciliation and readmission to their former privileges. This seems immediately to predict the restoration of the Jews and many Israelites with them from the Babylonish captivity, when they were effectually cured of gross idolatry, but the future conversion of the nation may also be intended. Verses 8 and 9. The people did not understand, consider, or acknowledge that the Lord gave them all their temporal mercies, and this forgetfulness exposed them to be tempted to abuse them in sacrifices, oblations, or vestments, prepared for Baal and other idols. To convince them of this, the Lord intended to resume his grant. It had been but a loan to them, which he would recover by distraining upon them for it, seeing they had thus most evidently forfeited it. At the very season when she expects to receive the fruits of the earth, her enemies shall invade her and destroy them. Loth. Verses 10 to 13. God himself determined to cause all the nations whose idols Israel had worshipped to witness their wickedness and shame, nor should any deliver them from deserved punishment. The Israelites observed festivals in honour of their idols, yet they seem to have paid regard to some of those appointed in the law, and to have made them seasons of carnal mirth and sensual indulgence, and the Jews came from the worship of idols to celebrate them at the temple. Jeremiah 7 verses 9 and 10. But the Lord would turn their mirth into mourning, when by his desolating judgments he destroyed all their vines and fig trees, which they vainly supposed were given them by their idols as a recompense for worshipping them. Thus he would visit on the nation the sins of all those days and years during which they had worshipped Baalim or idols, when they had resembled an adulteress that adorns herself with her most costly attire at the expense of her injured husband, that she may be the more agreeable to her vile paramours, for they were entirely forgetful of the authority of God and their obligations to him. Jehu had destroyed Baal out of Israel, but the people had substituted other idols in his place, and so had filled up the measure of their fathers' crimes. It is probable that the idolaters adorned themselves with great care, as well as wore peculiar garments when worshipping their idols. 2 Kings 10 verse 22. By showing how harlots trim themselves to please others, he declareth that superstitious idolaters set a great part of their religion in decking themselves on their holy days. Verses 14 to 17. The preceding prophecies were fulfilled in the captivities of Israel and Judah, and perhaps in the present dispersion of the Jews. But when these judgments had prepared the way, the Lord intended to deal with them in a more gentle manner. He would allure or persuade them to return to him by invitations and hopes of reconciliation and felicity. He would thus draw them off from carnal pleasures and confidences, and make all their former delusions to vanish, so that they would see themselves in a barren wilderness, and exposed to inevitable ruin unless the Lord helped them, as was the case with their fathers in the wilderness, and when they should thus be reduced to despair of help, he would speak comfortably to them, and encourage them to trust in his mercy, grace, and providence. Thus he would, from that destitute and forlorn condition, restore them to the possession of their former privileges, as if fruitful vineyards were suddenly given in a barren wilderness." and the valley of Achor, or Trouble, where Achan was stoned, in which Israel had fallen before his enemies, would be for a door of hope, preparing them for mercy, by humbling them and leading them to renounce their idols, and seek help from God alone. This valley was also one of the first acquisitions of Israel in Canaan, and an encouraging earnest of their possessing the whole. Thus being delivered from all their enemies and sorrows, they would sing praises with joyful hearts, as their fathers had done before, when they saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. From that time they would be more cordially attached to the Lord than ever, no longer calling him Bali, or my Lord and Master, alluding to the authority, rather than the affection of a husband, but Ishi, which is the language of cordial affection, in a woman speaking to her husband. For the abuse of the word Balim in the worship of their idols should lead to a total disuse of it, so that it should no more be remembered or employed by them. This may primarily foretell their restoration from the Babylonish captivity, yet it may also be applied to the conversion of the Jews and Israelites to Christ in the apostolic days and to the future conversion of that nation. Perhaps the incarnation of Christ may be referred to in the name here mentioned, Ishi, my husband, or literally man. Isaiah 32 verses 1 and 2. Verses 18 to 20. When the people were weaned from idols and attached in love and faithfulness to the worship of the Lord, 
he would then not only renew his covenant with them but he would make a covenant in their behalf with the beasts of the field etc that is he would take care that no creature should do them any harm and that all should concur in doing them good their land was occupied by the beasts of the field during the captivity when it had been desolated by war but he would afterwards rid the country of these creatures and defend it from invaders and make it a quiet and secure habitation for them nay he would betroth them to himself as their husband their kind friend protector and companion in the most solemn and public manner he would engage the honour of his righteousness wisdom loving-kindness mercy and truth for their security employ these attributes for their good and glorify himself in his dealings with them he would communicate to them wisdom righteousness sanctification and redemption he would enrich ennoble adorn and rejoice them with all the comforts and blessings of the marriage relation and perform all his precious promises to them and thus he would cause them to know him as their lord and god this can only be understood in its highest sense of the conversion of the jews to christ and of the inestimable blessings and privileges of the spiritual israel of all true believers to which they are admitted by faith in christ and union with him and a participation of his righteousness unsearchable riches and mediatorial blessings no etc thou shalt find that i am and will be a gracious lord unto thee bishop hall verses twenty one to twenty three when this happy change should take place in israel's condition that had before been so desolate and perilous all things in heaven and earth would contribute to their advantage this is represented in very bold figurative language the heavens are introduced as beseeching the lord to fill their clouds with water to water the land and he promises to hear them the earth is represented as calling on the heavens to pour down rain and they hear the fruits of the ground call also on the earth to furnish them with supplies and are heard and these again regard the desires and wants of jezreel or that people who had been the seed of god yet by him scattered but are now to be gathered to him all nature seems here alive and active in helping the converted jews and the supply of their spiritual wants in answer to the prayers of the people and ministers of christ and through the ordinances of his appointment may also be thus typified the dispersion of the jews would at length prove like the scattering of seed upon the earth in order to a large increase for god would through them or by means of his believing people who are dispersed as seed in the earth have mercy on them who had not obtained mercy and gather those among his people that had not before owned him as their god this is applied by the apostles to the conversion both of jews and gentiles to christ and we may suppose that the latter part of the chapter refers to that restoration of israel which shall be as life from the dead to the nations of the earth practical observations verses one to thirteen we should own and love all those as brethren whom the lord appears to have put among his children and encourage them with the consideration that they have obtained mercy and are become the people of god but the ministers of christ must not connive at the abuses or crimes of that religious community which claims the authority and stands in the relation to them of a mother for the glory of god and the interests of his truth and righteousness should be far nearer to our hearts than the credit or favour of our fellow-creatures however related to us or advanced above us and indeed every christian ought by his example profession and conversation to protest against the superstitions errors or abuses of that church to which he belongs or from which he hath been brought forth for eminently pious persons are sometimes raised up within these corrupt churches which god is about to give up to destruction on purpose to bear testimony against them and call men to repentance that a remnant may be preserved or rescued from the contagion that hath infected the rest if men would escape sin and condemnation they must put all occasions of evil out of sight repress the rising sinful inclinations of the heart and shun whatever may be a temptation to them or render them temptations to others impenitent sinners will soon be stripped of all their abused advantages and worldly prosperity and exposed to the utmost shame contempt and misery and they who have trained up their children in impiety iniquity or false religion cannot reasonably expect that god will confer spiritual blessings upon them such men often ascribe their temporal enjoyments to their sins or idols and thus are emboldened to more iniquity whereas the lord giveth us all things richly to enjoy and the devil tempts men to consume them upon their lusts 
when we are infatuated by the violence of any headstrong passion or harassing temptation, and bent upon the gratification of our depraved inclinations, it is a special mercy to have our way hedged up with thorns, or closed by some insurmountable wall, that we may not be able to overtake our beloved idols and pleasures, and if pain, sickness, or calamity keep us from sin, we should be thankful for it. Every gracious soul will habitually prefer suffering to sin, and it is even a mercy to ungodly men to be kept by severe affliction from treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. But if unsurmountable obstructions and inextricable difficulties not only disable them for a time from finding any pleasure in their sins or from committing them, but are the means at length of bringing them to themselves to perceive and lament their folly in departing from God and to return to Him humbly seeking forgiveness and salvation, the mercy is inestimably precious. When professors of the gospel depart from the ways of God and meet with no such thorn hedges and strong walls to impede their sinful course, and to bring them back ashamed and humbled, their case looks very dark. But if backsliders are by such discipline led to say, I will go and return to the Lord, that I may again have the comfort of communion with Him, and of my relation to Him, for then it was far better with me than now, we should encourage and exhort them to decision in so doing. If men forget or consider not that their comforts come from God, and so they use them in a sinful manner, He will often in mercy take them away, to bring the offenders to reflect on their folly and danger. When he turns unjust stewards out of their stewardship and calls them to give an account of it, none of their friends or idols can deliver them out of his hand, and all shall see and be constrained to confess that they deserve their ignominy and misery. In this our land of affluence and abundance, what numbers prepare their corn, wine, oil, gold, and silver for Baal, by their excess luxury and ostentation. And... Often the behaviour of those that are employed in gathering in the precious fruits of the earth seems to be an attempt to revive the Bacchanalian riots of ancient idolaters. Men who live in allowed sin and then pretend to rejoice in God's ordinances or on religious festivals, as many ungodly persons do in their carnal way of celebrating Christmas, etc., are most awfully deceived. All such rejoicing is vain and tends to weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verses 14 to 23. When sinners seem ripe for vengeance, the Lord sometimes shows his sovereign grace in having mercy on them. To bring them to repentance, he both drives them from their sins by his terrors and judgments, and allures them by discoveries of his love and hopes of acceptance and happiness. He often deprives them of all hope and comfort in the world and from themselves, and when their humiliation, terrors, and sorrows tend to desperation, he speaks comfortably to their hearts. He brings them into a desolate wilderness where no joy can be found except from his mercy, and thence he gives them all the provisions of his grace and the comforts and privileges of his salvation. He makes the valley of deep dejection and extreme trouble to be a door of hope to them, and drives them to despair of earthly joy and help from themselves, that being shut out from every other door they may knock at mercy's gate until it be opened. Then their terrors and sorrows are terminated, he brings them out of the horrible pit and puts a new song into their mouths, and they sing, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, yet thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is become my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. Though the Lord loses none of his authority by his condescending love to us, yet his awful majesty thus becomes the object of our confidence and delight, and believers are enabled to expect all that tenderness and kindness from their holy God, which a beloved wife can expect from the most affectionate husband, yea, far more. But he saves them from their idols, and sets them against their sins, and disposes them to walk before him in newness of life, as well as gives them the joy of his favour and salvation. If this new covenant be made with us, he will make all things to work together for our good, and every creature shall help us, for all things are ours, even death itself, and we may lie down with peace and security in his clay-cold bed, having committed our spirit into the Redeemer's hands. Happy then are they who are thus betrothed to the Lord in righteousness, judgment, loving-kindness, mercies, and faithfulness, though in themselves poor and polluted, weak and foolish, yet in him they have wisdom, strength, and righteousness, and they are enriched, ennobled, arrayed with garments of salvation, and made most blessed for evermore. Even the vilest of transgressors are now invited to seek, and encouraged to hope for, union with the Lord of life and glory in this honourable and endeared relation, 
nor can too much be expected from his grace who shed his precious blood for rebels and enemies let us then seek an interest in these blessings compared with which all others are worthless let us remember that we are sown in the earth as seed that in our several places we may conduce to the conversion of our fellow sinners that they may seek and obtain mercy who had not obtained mercy and that they may say to the lord thou art my god who have been strangers and enemies let us keep this object in view in all our actions and our whole conversation and let us continually pour out our supplications for ourselves and all around us to god who will give grace and glory and withhold no good thing from those that walk uprightly chapter three the Lord's intended future kindness to Israel, notwithstanding their wickedness, illustrated by the emblem of Hosea's conduct toward his adulterous wife. Verses 1 to 5. Verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. Verse 2. So I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver, and for an homer of barley, and an half homer of barley. Verse 3. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. Verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Verse 5. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Notes. Verses 1 to 3. Some interpret this as a vision or parable which the prophet spake to the people, but they who consider it as a fact have some hesitation in deciding whether it related to Hosea's former wife or to another woman on whom he was to fix his affections. It seems, however, most probable that it is the continuation and conclusion of the prophet's account of this transaction, with which his prophetical office began, and which was a picture of the Lord's dealing with Israel. He had married a woman of bad character, and had treated her with affection and kindness, yet she afterwards became an adulteress, and departed from him. She had been beloved of her friend and husband, but proved unfaithful, yet he continued to love her, and he was directed to go and show his love by his conduct towards her. Instead of a public prosecution or a private divorce, he went with overtures of reconciliation, and only required that she would remain in a state of separation from him for many days, a competent time to evince the sincerity of her repentance, and that she would no more renew her adulteries but reserve herself for him, and then he promised to consider himself as her husband, and at length to take her back to him. The money and the barley with which he bought her to him, accorded to the customs of those times when they often gave dowries for instead of receiving them with their wives this implied that the marriage had been virtually dissolved by her adulteries and perhaps it served or was intended for her maintenance during the days of her seclusion and to keep her from the temptation of becoming a harlot for subsistence and the small sum of money about one pound seventeen shillings sixpence and the coarseness of the provisions being barley not wheat might denote the disgraced and abject condition to which her sin had reduced her and might intimate that she ought to submit to present inconveniences and wait patiently the time of being restored to favour we may conclude from the things signified by this transaction that she submitted to the terms was received again by the prophet and behaved better afterwards for this was according to the love of the lord for the children of israel some interpret this almost wholly of the kingdom of Israel, but the prophecy seems to require us to understand it of the whole people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had been espoused to the Lord in the wilderness, notwithstanding their idolatries in Egypt, and yet, after all the displays of his love to them, through their successive generations, they were always prone to fix their eyes on base idols. This was adultery, a violation of their marriage covenant. They also loved flagons of wine, they were attached to idol worship because in it they gave unbridled license to their sensual appetites but the lord still had love for the nation and though he meant to deprive them of their privileges exclude them from his church for many days and to debase and reduce them to great distress yet they would still subsist as a distinct people and at length be anew betrothed to him and reinstated in his favour and the full enjoyment of their privileges the words which our translation renders flagons of wine may be translated 
cakes made of grapes. Such were the cakes, probably, which the Jews offered to the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 7 verse 18, 44 verse 19. The expression signifies in general those entertainments which they were partakers of in the idol temples. Loth. Verses 4 and 5. The kingdom of Israel was soon after this entirely ruined, and the people were incorporated either with the Jews or the nations among whom they resided, and have had neither king, prince, priest, sacrifice, or religious establishment from that day to this. The Jews remained for several years without these advantages during the Babylonish captivity, yet their civil and religious constitution was again restored. But since the rejection of that nation at the introduction of Christianity and the destruction of their city and temple by the Romans, they have continued to this time, for much above seventeen hundred years, without king or prince of their own nation, and without priest or sacrifice, or anything substituted in the place of the temple worship. And, what is still more remarkable, they have also remained without an image, ephod, or teraphim, without any of those idolatrous observances and apparatus to which they were so generally attached when this prophecy was uttered. From the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by Vespasian, to this day, they have had no civil government of their own, but live everywhere as so many exiles, only upon sufferance. They have had neither priests nor sacrifice, their temple being destroyed, where only they were to offer sacrifice. And yet the want of a place where to perform the most solemn part of their public worship does not tempt them to idolatry, which was the epidemic sin of their forefathers. Loath. This is surely a most astonishing prophecy of events directly contrary to all human probability, yet undeniably taking place, not on a particular occasion or for a short time, but through very many revolving centuries. How could Hosea have foreseen this had not God inspired him? And does not this demonstrate, in the only way by which such things can be demonstrated, the divine inspiration of this prophecy and of those by whom it is quoted? It was also predicted that afterwards they should return from their state of rejection and unbelief, and seek the Lord their God and David their King. This even their own writers explained of the promised Messiah, and doubtless it foretold their future conversion to Christ, for which they are evidently preserved a separate people, neither a part of the true church, nor yet given up to spiritual adultery, but put aside on a separate scanty maintenance, in a debased condition for a long time, like Hosea's wife, to be at length received to favour again. It is added, They shall fear the Lord and his goodness. The discovery which these events shall make of the Lord's goodness and of his unmerited kindness and mercy to them in Christ Jesus will fill them with reverential awe of him, and a fear of offending so kind a friend, and will fix their hearts in the spiritual worship of him and conscientious obedience of his commandments. This would be in the latter days under the gospel dispensation at that approaching period when they shall be converted to Christ, and gathered from their present dispersions. Practical Observations When we consider the ingratitude and folly even of believers, their frequent hankerings after and idolatrous attachment to worldly objects and essential gratifications, which is proportionably an unfaithfulness to God and a departure from Him, we shall admire His persevering love to them, almost as much as his condescension and compassion to sinners in the glorious salvation provided for them, and the price with which it was purchased. And as far as consists with other duties, we should copy his example in our readiness to forgive, and be reconciled to those who have most ungratefully and grossly injured us. The dislike of men to true religion arises from their preference of sensual to spiritual pleasures. They therefore love an object and a form of worship which allow them to indulge instead of requiring them to mortify their lusts. But he will cure the objects of his special love of these base propensities. He will rebuke, disgrace, and afflict them for their sins. He will unite his overtures of reconciliation and tokens of love with various humiliating dispensations. He will bring them to repentance, to submit to correction, to separate from sin and worldly idols, and patiently to wait for him, and when they are thus willing to reserve themselves for him alone, he will give himself to them as their God and portion. The objects of his special love are often left for a time in a state of humiliating desertion, without any comfortable communion with him, in order to prove their faith and patience. Many of them live a great while in an unconverted state, Yet are they restrained from such crimes as would utterly ruin them, or prevent them from filling up their appointed stations in the church. In due season they are brought to seek the Lord, to trust in the divine Saviour, and to rejoice in his holy comfort. 
and though their first fear of God arise from a view of his terrible holy majesty and his righteous and powerful vengeance, yet the discovery of his goodness and his love to sinners through Jesus Christ, and the experience of his mercy and grace, sweetly lead their hearts to a filial reverence of so kind and glorious a friend and father, to an habitual fear of offending and dishonouring him, a dread of his frown and correcting rod, and an adoring awe of him, when they present their worship and services before him. May we, who live in these latter days, thus fear the Lord and his goodness, and may both Jews and Gentiles thus seek and worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 4 God denounces judgments on Israel for their impieties and iniquities. Verses 1-5 to five. He exposes the ignorance and wickedness of the priests and determines to reject them. Verses 6-11 to 11. To punish the idolatry and profligacy of the people, he will leave their wives and daughters to commit lewdness without present punishment. Verses 12-14 to 14. He warns Judah not to imitate Israel's crimes, which are further approved. Verses 15-19 to 19. Verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Verse 2. By swearing and lying, and killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Verse 3. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Verse 4. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Verse 5. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Verse 7. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. Verse 8. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. Verse 9. And there shall be like people like priest, and I will punish them for their ways, and reward them their doings. Verse 10. For they shall eat and not have enough, they shall commit whoredom, and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Verse 11. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Verse 12. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. Verse 13. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains, and burn incense upon the hills, under oaks and poplars, and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. Verse 14. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Verse 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to Beth-Avon, nor swear the Lord liveth. Verse 16. For Israel slideth back a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Verse 18. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. Give ye. Verse 19. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Notes. Verses 1 to 3. Hosea is here supposed by expositors in general to address the kingdom of Israel exclusively, and perhaps he spake immediately to those of the ten tribes as living among them. Yet his reproofs and exhortations were so framed as to suit the case of the Jews also when they came into their hands. The former chapters seem to have formed one general subject, consisting of several messages delivered to the people, when at God's command he married Goma, when her children were born and named, when she departed from him, and when he proposed to her terms of reconciliation. But he here began to speak to them in direct language, concerning their immoralities and idolatries. The children of Israel, or the whole family of Jacob, are called upon to hear the word of the Lord, who had a controversy with all the inhabitants of the promised land. 
for though he meant first to proceed against Israel, Judah would not escape without repentance and entire reformation. The ground of this controversy was, because there was no truth, mercy, or knowledge of God in the land. There was hardly any sincerity, veracity, or fidelity to be found amongst them. They were dissemblers in religion, and they were deceivers and impostors in their commerce with each other. As there was no honesty among them, it could scarcely be expected there should be any mercy or compassion or kindness to the poor and afflicted, and in fact they were cruel and selfish extortioners and oppressors of the poor, and they neither knew the character of God, nor his truth or will, so as to be influenced by it, to piety, justice, or charity. But their desperate inward wickedness broke out into multiplied and aggravated perjuries, blasphemies, lies, murders, thefts, and adulteries, the whole body politic was become like one putrid ulcer, or bleeding cancer, or many, all running into one. Especially the whole land was full of murders, which were committed in the conspiracies of one usurper against another, in which the adherents of each slaughtered ruler were cut off by the victorious party in great numbers, one company after another. Therefore the most distressing calamities were coming on the land, which would reduce all the inhabitants to the extremest miseries, and end in its total desolation, till neither beasts, fowls, nor fishes were left. These are figurative expressions denoting the entire destruction or dispersion of all the people. Verses 4 and 5 Yet no man contendeth, and no man reproveth. This is a natural rendering, and gives a very usual sense to the Hebrew future. Bishop Newcomb while wickedness of all kinds was openly committed, there was no one, either magistrate or priest or prophet, who protested against it, or steadily opposed it. According to our version, the words imply that the case was desperate. All were too wicked to be employed as reprovers, or too proud and obstinate to endure reproof. Nay, they were ready to turn against and rend their reprovers, even when authorized by God himself, being in the spirit of Korah and his company, when they strove against Aaron, the priest of the Lord, or like Joash king of Judah, who stoned Zechariah the prophet, the son of his benefactor, Jehoiada, when he reproved him for his sins, 2 Chronicles 24. Some object to this interpretation because it could not be a crime to contend with idolatrous priests, but the conduct of Israel towards the prophets of God, and others who reproved them, might resemble that of such as contended with his priests. They would therefore fall in the approaching day of vengeance, or when they thought themselves most secure, and the ruin of their false prophets would be like that of those who are surprised with calamity in the night, when the terror and distress are more affecting than in the daytime. Yea, the Lord would slay the mother as well as the children, the whole constitution of the church and nation, as well as individual Israelites, or Samaria the capital of Israel. It was a capital offence by the law for any to behave themselves in a presumptuous manner against the injunctions of the priests. Deuteronomy 17, verse 12. Loath. If thou fallest in the day, the prophets shall not be long after thee. They shall fall in the night, and I will destroy the very church and kingdom whereto thou appertainest. Bishop Hall. Verse 6. The professed worshippers of Jehovah were perishing in the most entire ignorance of true religion. This was in great measure the fault of the priests and teachers who utterly neglected their duty and indeed were incapable of performing it. The whole company of priests seemed to be here addressed as one person. As he had despised and rejected knowledge and willfully forgotten the word of God, therefore God would reject him and take no care of his posterity. We cannot suppose that this was exclusively addressed to the priests of the golden calves and other priests in Israel, whom God had never acknowledged, but it must, in part at least, be spoken of the family of Aaron, whom he had appointed to the priesthood, but would at length reject for their ignorance and wickedness. Some of these might reside in Israel, but most of them were in Judah, which must therefore be here included. Verses 7 to 11. In proportion as the priests increased in numbers and prosperity, they grew notorious for wickedness. The Lord would therefore render the honour which had been conferred on them, an occasion of their deeper disgrace, by exposing their crimes and inflicting ignominious punishments on them. They did not attempt to reform the people, but were well pleased to have the sin offerings multiplied, as they feasted on the flesh and had many perquisites from them, and they therefore delighted in the iniquity of the people as increasing their incomes. Thus absolutions, indulgences, and dispensations have long enriched the Romish clergy, and spiritual courts have prosecuted such offenders as could afford to pay fines and fees, 
apparently for no other reason, and many such things have been and are perpetrated by the professed ministers of religion. All these priests were the patterns of the people in their crimes. They would be involved with them in punishment without distinction. At length they would be reduced to pinching famine and unsatisfied hunger. Their multiplying of wives and concubines, contrary to the original law of marriage, and their other scandalous lewdness would prevent the increase of their families, and seeing they had left off to take heed to the Lord, manifest evils would come upon them. This shows that the priests of Aaron's family were chiefly intended, for the priests of the calves and those of Baal had not, at any time, taken heed to the Lord. Indeed the whoredom and intemperance both of priests and people deprived them of understanding and judgment, and rendered their hearts and consciences unfeeling and utterly unfit for anything good. The people's sins deserved to be punished with such priests, and such priests have helped to make the people thus wicked. Bishop Hall Verses 12-14 to 14. The professed worshippers of Jehovah were so infatuated by their indulgences and idolatrous practices that they preferred consulting their wooden images to inquiring of God by his word, his prophets, or the high priest, and they even divined by means of their staves, in some superstitious manner, being utterly given up to idols, and alienated from God. Because they take away God's honour and give it to idols, therefore he will give them up to their lusts to dishonour their bodies. Romans 1 verse 28. They therefore preferred the mountains and groves where the idols were worshipped to his temple, because they afforded an agreeable shade and secret recesses for their abominable impurities. To punish these enormities, the Lord determined to leave their daughters and wives to disgrace and to distress them, by committing whoredom and adultery. Nor would he inflict on them any immediate judgment for these crimes, which would eventually embolden them to proceed and others to imitate them, and so to become the scourges of their idolatrous fathers and husbands. And indeed this would be the natural consequence of their crimes, for themselves, the original is masculine, though fathers and husbands, separated from their families, to associate with abandoned harlots, even with such as were initiated or consecrated to be priestesses of their abominable idols, and prostitutes to their worshippers. Thus they set their wives and daughters an example of the vilest licentiousness, even in religion, and did what they could to corrupt their principles and morals and a people that had become thus besotted and infatuated, notwithstanding all their religious advantages, could not long escape destruction. The marginal references show that many of the same charges were brought by the prophets against Judah, though Israel is here supposed to be principally intended. Verse 15. Here Israel and Judah are separately addressed. The former were wholly given up to idolatry and iniquity, but let not Judah thus offend, they yet have many advantages, and from them the Messiah was to arise. But if the Jews meant to avoid the crimes and ruin of Israel, let them not come near the places where idolatry was practised. Gilgal had been in many instances peculiarly distinguished, but it was become notorious for idolatry. Beth-Avon was the same as Bethel. It had been the house of God, but it was at that time the house of vanity, for so Beth-Avon signifies. Neither let them dare to swear by the name of Jehovah whilst worshipping their idols, for he abhorred such a coalition, or before the calves, as if they had represented him. God complaineth that Judah is infected, and willeth them to return in time. Verses 16 to 19 Israel was become utterly intractable and obstinate in rebellion, like a refractory heifer that hangs back and will not draw in the yoke. The Lord therefore intended to disperse them throughout the Assyrian Empire, where they would be as much exposed to injury and violence as a single deserted lamb in a wilderness to the wild beasts. Ephraim, or the kingdom of Israel, was incurably devoted to idols, and the people should no more be molested by the unwelcome warnings of prophets, or other means of reformation, but be let alone to ripen for destruction. He, Ephraim, is gone after their wine, he is gone after the wine or banquet of idols, Bishop Newcomb. Or he is loathsome through drunkenness. The people were continually given up to whoredom, corporal and spiritual. Their rulers were shamefully corrupt, and showed evidently their love of bribes, even demanding them of the people, as the price of deciding in their favour, and therefore they would be hurried into captivity, as by a furious, irresistible tempest, and then they would be ashamed of depending on their idolatrous or hypocritical sacrifices. Practical Observations 
verses 1 to 11. The Lord has a controversy with us on account of our sins, and if he contend either in judgment or in battle, he will overcome. It is therefore our interest as well as duty to submit and humble ourselves before him. Dreadful is the case of that land which, being favoured with the oracles of God, yet remains devoid of truth, mercy, and piety, and abounds in gross immoralities. We hope this is not absolutely the case with our country, yet we cannot but perceive that many of these reproofs are too applicable to our national character. Our distempered constitution, as to religion and morality, breaks out most grievously by perjuries, profaneness, falsehood, murders, thefts, and shameful adulteries and licentiousness, and the additional prevalence of avowed infidelity and irreligion renders the nation as one continued leprosy, except as the Lord hath yet reserved to himself a despised remnant of another character. He, however, hath doubtless a controversy with the inhabitants of this favoured land, and what mourning and desolating judgments he may see good to bring upon us we cannot tell. Yet there is encouragement for us to protest and strive against sin, and to reprove transgressors, and though many prove refractory and incorrigible, and revile those that speak to them by the authority of God, thus exposing themselves to swift and sudden destruction with their flattering teachers and the societies to which they belong, yet others are found more teachable. But before we venture to reprove others, it behooves us to inquire whether the reproved persons may not retort on us, Physician, heal thyself, and surely a beam in our own eye will incapacitate us from taking a mote from our brother's eye, we must not, however, be discouraged by lamented imperfections from so good a work, provided we be not conscious of any allowed wickedness. But alas, what multitudes, even in this enlightened land, are perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, of his law, his gospel, and of their own state, interest, and duty. Ignorance only can be the parent of superstition or enthusiasm. Without divine illumination the heart cannot be good, and the ministry of the word is the grand means of that illumination. When the professed teachers of Christianity therefore reject knowledge and forget the word of God to pursue other studies, pleasures, or interests, the Lord will reject them and pour contempt on their families also. The wealth and temporal grandeur of the clergy hath commonly proved an inlet to their increasing iniquity, and their glory in this sense hath proved their shame. At all times this sacred function is a reproach to him who is a scandal to it, and his honourable office renders him doubly contemptible. Too many of the clergy regard nothing but the emoluments of their office. They are not grieved at the sins of their people, provided they regularly pay their dues, and the increase of their livings pleases them more than the spiritual good of their flocks. Thus they, as it were, feast on the sins of the people, and leave them unmolested in their evil courses, that they may have less trouble in collecting their dues. For priest and people, being both of the same nature, are liable to commit the same crimes, and incur the same condemnation except as the same offences are more heinous, and will be more severely punished in the former than in the latter. Abused wealth tends to poverty, and avarice to disgraces and ruin, and when the clergy leave off to take heed to the Lord, no wonder they are left by him to disgrace themselves by the most scandalous excesses. Sensual lusts stupefy the understanding, harden the heart, and sear the conscience. How, then, can they who indulge in them be fitted for the weighty and holy work of the ministry, or indeed for anything important and useful. Verses 12 to 19. They who like not to retain God in their knowledge are often given up to strong delusions and left to lead others into the same judicial infatuations. Thus they train up their families by example, influence, and sophistry in error and impiety, which always tend to vice and immorality. But how can they who are unfaithful to God expect their wives and children to be faithful to them? Or how can they expect others to maintain their chastity while notoriously guilty of lewdness in their own conduct? In this way, men prepare scourges for themselves, and vice and misery are diffused through whole cities and communities. Let us then watch against all approaches to those abuses which have gradually led to greater impiety, and keep our religious worship wholly free from all mixture of superstition and sensual indulgence. Whilst sinners obstinately reject the easy yoke of Christ, they are bringing down the heavy load of his vengeance upon themselves, and when they have proceeded to a certain degree of hardness and determination in their crimes, the Lord says, Let them alone. Then they receive no more warnings, feel no more convictions, are visited with no more corrections, or are left to despise them. Their conscience lies dormant, and the Spirit of God strives no more with them. 
from the brink of this precipice, may we be kept at the greatest distance. God will abhor the sacrifices and services of those who neglect honesty in their dealings, and when magistrates and rulers love to be bribed to pervert justice, it is not only most shameful and abominable, but it is a grievous symptom of approaching national judgments. And when the wrath of God, like an impetuous tempest, shall hurry sinners into everlasting ruin, they will be as much ashamed of their pharisaical or hypocritical services as of their open impieties and iniquities. Chapter 5 The judgments of God denounced against the priests, people, and princes, both of Israel and Judah, for their manifold sins. Verses 1 to 14. An intimation of mercy on their repentance. Verse 15. Verse 1. Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken, ye house of Israel, and give ye ear, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. Verse 2. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. Verse 3. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. Verse 4. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. Verse 5. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face, therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity, Judah also shall fall with them. Verse 6. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. Verse 7. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Verse 8. Blow ye the cornet in Gebir, and the trumpet in Ramah, cry aloud at Beth-Avon, after thee, O Benjamin. Verse 9. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. Verse 10. The princes of Judah were like them that remove the bound. Therefore I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Verse 11. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment, because he willingly walked after the commandment. Verse 12, Therefore I will be unto Ephraim as a moth, and to the house of Judah as rottenness. Verse 13, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian, and sent to King Jareb, yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wound. Verse 14, For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah, I, even I, will tear and go away, I will take away, and none shall rescue him. Verse 15, I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Notes Verses 1 and 2 These idolatrous priests and the courtiers and servants of the king of Israel, with himself at the head of them, were warned to expect the speedy approach of the judgment of God against them, because they had bestowed as much pains and used as much art to entangle the people in idolatry to their ruin as the fowler employed in spreading snares and nets upon the mountains to take the birds. They doubtless used arguments, persuasions, flatteries, menaces, and persecutions to induce them to conform to the established worship of the golden calves, or of Baal. Some think that they also set spies to watch that none of the people went up to worship at Jerusalem in order to ensnare and punish them. These apostates from God's worship were very deep, designing and crafty, as well as cruel, in promoting the persecution and murder of those who adhered to God or opposed them, though the Lord, by his prophets and in his providence, frequently and sharply rebuked and chastised them for their crimes. Verses 3 and 4. Ephraim, the principal tribe in the kingdom of Israel, is frequently, by a figure of speech, put for the whole, the Lord knew not only that the Israelites had revolted from him and polluted themselves with idols, but also that they were so attached to these abominations and so alienated from him that they were not at all disposed to repent and turn to him and do works meet for repentance. Verse 5. The idolatrous Israelites proudly refused to submit to God, to return to his worship or to seek forgiveness. They insolently justified themselves and as it were, set him at defiance, by their impenitent rebellion and self-confidence, and this arrogance, which was visible even in their looks, would prove the immediate cause of their ruin, 
and as Judah also was treading in their steps, they would at length fall with them under the same condemnation. Note chapter 4 verse 15. Verse 6. This verse is meant of Judah, though they did frequent the temple worship, yet they came thither without any true sense of religion. God is said to hide or withdraw himself when he will not answer men's prayers, nor afford them reasonable help in time of need. Loath. Verse 7. The people married idolaters and brought up their children as heathens, estranged from God and his worship. This ripened them for destruction, so that a month, or a short and limited time, would destroy both them and the idols which they had chosen for their portion. Verses 8-10. to 10. The prophet called upon the watchmen of Israel and Judah to blow the trumpet of alarm, for the enemy was just at hand and when the Assyrians had desolated the cities of Israel, even to Beth-Avon, the principal seat of idolatry, they would fall upon Benjamin also, which belonged to the kingdom of Judah. Ephraim would be totally desolated by the enemy, in the approaching day of rebuke, for the prophet had declared among the tribes of Israel that only which would surely come to pass. The princes of Judah, by violating God's law, had broken down the fence of his protection, and made way for his wrath to be poured out upon them, as an inundation of waters. When Ahaz, king of Judah, with his princes, called on the kings of Assyria to help him against Syria and Israel, he removed the bound and opened the way for that inundation which desolated Israel and reduced Judah to deep distress. Verses 11 and 12. The Israelites suffered exceedingly from the exactions and oppressions of their rulers and of victorious invaders. This was permitted in order to punish them for their willing and persevering obedience to the laws of Jeroboam and his successors, which required them to worship the golden calves at Dan and Bethel, and to conform to other established idolatries in express contradiction to the law of God. He would therefore insensibly yet assuredly waste their strength and prosperity as a moth eats holes in the garment, and as Judah had proved equally submissive to the will of their idolatrous kings, he would consume them, as rottenness and worms do the wood. Verses 13 and 14. When Israel and Judah, at different times, found themselves pressed by enemies and dangers, instead of humbling themselves before God and seeking his help, they sought the protection of the Assyrians and sent to King Jareb, perhaps another name for Pul or tiglath pileser But instead of healing their wounds or doing them any service, they helped to make them incurable. This obstinacy provoked the Lord to become their open enemy and to destroy them, as a fierce young lion would tear and carry away the helpless cattle, whilst none of their idols or allies could rescue them from his hands. Jareb signifies, he shall plead. The king of Assyria perhaps undertook to be an arbitrator between Judah and Israel and to mediate a peace. Verse 15. The mercy seat was properly the Lord's place among his people, which he left when he came forth to execute vengeance upon them. But, having done this, he meant to return to his place, and there to wait and to leave them under their punishment, till they should repent, or plead guilty and confess their sins, and seek his favour and protection. And he knew that, however they had despised him in their affliction, they would feel their need of him, and seek him without delay or remissness. Practical Observations all ranks of men must stand before God in judgment, and all ought to yield an obedient ear to his word, and to the warnings of his ministers, to flee from the wrath to come. For as all have sinned, all should repent, and humbly seek his pardoning mercy. None are exposed to severer punishment than they who artfully entice men to sin and ensnare them in fatal errors, and kings and priests have often been peculiarly guilty of this great transgression. They who apostatize from God and his truth commonly become the bitterest enemies to such as adhere to him. They have often employed most profound dissimulation and diabolical malice to make slaughter of them as enemies to the church and state, and rebukes and corrections have seldom deterred them from persecuting projects. The Lord perfectly knows men, and none of their designs or motives are concealed from him though they deeply disguise them from others, and even from themselves, and cover their grossest defilements with specious pretensions. Our doings must be carefully framed to return to the Lord, if we would be at peace with him, for he delighteth not in a vain profession, and empty forms or notions, but he requires that our repentance and faith be manifested in our whole temper and conduct. 
but they who know not the Lord nor the power of his anger, the value of his favour, and the efficacy of his converting grace, remain under the influence of that spirit which worketh in the children of disobedience, and will never frame their doings to return to God. Pride makes men obstinate in other sins, and rivets the chains which sensual or worldly lusts have forged, for the wicked, through the pride of their countenance, will not seek after God, or submit to him in sincere repentance, and therefore, having fallen into, they must perish in iniquity. With such unhumbled, unbelieving, and rebellious hearts, men may go with their flocks and herds, and the most expensive and ostentatious services, to seek the Lord, but they will not find him for he withdraws himself from proud Pharisees and hypocrites to commune with broken-hearted publicans and sinners. By dealing treacherously with the Lord, men only deceive themselves. The educating of children as strangers to God and his truth exceedingly hastens the doom of guilty nations. When tokens of approaching ruin appear, ministers ought to give the alarm before evil overtake the criminals, and when some are cut off in the day of the Lord's rebuke, they must warn others to expect the same punishment unless they repent. Such things will be generally among the tribes of Israel, and the watchman must give warning if he mean to deliver his own soul. When princes break down the fence of the divine law, by their edicts, decisions, or examples, they open the floodgates of God's wrath, and when subjects willingly obey ungodly and persecuting statutes, they may expect to be given up to grievous oppressions and exactions, for God will disregard the interest, liberty, and security of those who disregard his honour and renounce his service. His more ordinary judgments unsensibly waste men's prosperity and comfort, but when, under rebukes, they trust to an arm of flesh, and have recourse to sinful expedients, they will not only find that they cannot bring cure or deliverance, but that God will visit them with more terrible displays of his indignation, Yet he will return to his place, his mercy seat, and wait there to be gracious to all who acknowledge their offences and seek his face. Many indeed who despise him in their prosperity appear to seek him under their afflictions, but he knows how to distinguish the upright from the hypocrite, and they who are first led by severe tribulations to seek him earnestly, diligently, and sincerely will find him a present help and an effectual refuge, as with him is mercy and plenteous redemption, for all those who call upon him in truth. Chapter 6 Exhortations to repent and hope in God, verses 1 to 3 A lamentation over those who had sinned after conviction, verse 4 Reproofs of obstinate sinners and threatenings against them, verses 5 to 11 Verse 1 Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Verse 2. After two days he will revive us, in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Verse 3. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Verse 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? for your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Verse 5. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. Verse 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Verse 7. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant, they have dealt treacherously against me. Verse 8. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity, and is polluted with blood. Verse 9. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. Verse 10. I have seen an horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whoredom of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. Verse 11. Also, O Judah, he hath set an harvest for thee, when I returned the captivity of my people. Notes Verses 1 to 3. The prophet took occasion from the intimation of mercy at the close of the former chapter to exhort the people without delay to come together and with one accord to return to the worship of the Lord. As this referred to the events predicted in the former chapter, that is, to the desolations that were coming on the people by the Assyrians and Chaldeans, the exhortation may be considered as the language of the penitents to each other and to their neighbour, calling on them to unite in humiliation, repentance, and works meet for repentance. 
They considered their miseries as the effect of God's righteous indignation. He had torn and smitten them, and their enemies were his instruments, and from his mercy, truth, and power alone they hoped for deliverance. He alone could, and they trusted he would, heal their distempers and bind up their wounds. Instead, therefore, of fleeing from him as an enemy, they encouraged each other to apply to him as their physician. For some time they would have to wait for his interposition. The nation of Israel was, as it were, dead, but after two days, that is, on the third day, the Lord would revive them, and they would live in his sight as his people, upon their return from the Babylonish captivity, after the appointed time of its continuance. The language is generally supposed to be prophetic of the resurrection of Christ on the third day, with whom, as her surety, the whole church on the third day, with whom, as her surety, the whole church virtually arose from the dead to live unto God. With him the hopes of all believers revived. His power, as risen, quickens their souls, when dead in sin, and his resurrection was an earnest of the resurrection of their bodies unto everlasting life. In the persevering exercise of faith, and by waiting on the Lord, in every means of becoming acquainted with him and his perfections, truth and will, they would obtain an experimental knowledge of his mercy and faithfulness, and a comforting knowledge of their own pardon and acceptance. For his going forth was prepared as the morning, the time that intervened between the promise of a saviour to fallen man unto his coming, and exultation at the right hand of the Father, resembled that which intervenes between the dawning of the day and the meridian brightness of the sun, and he would as surely come and effect the redemption of his church, as sunrising follows the dawn. His coming likewise to save and comfort every penitent would be gradual and certain, from his first sense of his guilt to the completion of his salvation in heavenly felicity. Note Proverbs 4, verses 13 and 19. In neither sense doth his going forth resemble a meteor, or the evening sun, but the increasing brightness of the morning from the first dawn, which can scarcely be discerned or distinguished from other appearances to the noonday brightness. The Lord would also descend upon the souls of those who waited on him, as the former and latter rain upon the earth, purifying, softening, fructifying, and refreshing them by the influences of his Holy Spirit. Verses 4 and 5 Neither Ephraim nor Judah would thus wait for and on the Lord, and he spake as one that was at a loss what to do with them. He was not willing wholly to give them up, yet he did not deem it honourable to save them from ruin in their present state of mind, and all means used to reform them had proved ineffectual. Whilst they were smarting under the rod, or filled with terror, or when their reforming kings were exerting their pious endeavours, or the prophets were labouring among them, they seemed favourably disposed to repent and return to the Lord, but this their goodness, unlike the morning light or the stated rain, vanished like the empty morning cloud and the early dew, and produced no abiding effect on their conduct, and when the causes of these transient impressions ceased, they relapsed into idolatry and iniquity, and were as vile as ever. In the night of adversity they seemed religious, but the rising sun of returning prosperity dispersed all these promising appearances. Therefore it was that the Lord sent them such awful messages by the prophets as were suited either to hew them into shape or to hew them in pieces. Nay, he slew them by the words of his mouth, which were like pronouncing the sentence of death on a criminal and giving orders for his execution, and the judgments that were denounced against them were gradually and suddenly approaching, as the light from the dawning of the day, instead of that favour which was arising upon true penitence, nay, the justice of God would be as clear as the morning light. Verse 6. All the appointed sacrifices were typical of Christ's atonement, external signs of the offerer's faith and repentance, acts of worship towards God and means of grace to believers. But the people deemed them the substantial part of religion, presented them in unbelief, pride, and impenitence, and thus to compensate by them, for their entire neglect of justice, mercy, and piety, and for all their scandalous crimes, and when they omitted these institutions they thought the Lord's controversy with them was chiefly on that account. He therefore informed them that he desired mercy and not sacrifice, or rather than sacrifice, and the knowledge of him which produced holy fear, dependence, submission, obedience, and love, more than burnt offerings, because they were of superior excellency and immutable obligation. He was displeased with them for their injustice, oppression of the poor, idolatry, and impiety, and no number of sacrifices could avail them whilst they continued in sin. 
this no way interferes with the great doctrine of the sacrifice of christ being the sole meritorious cause of a sinner's pardon and acceptance with god or with that of faith alone interesting us in his atonement or with the necessity of our attendance on instituted ordinances but it exposes the folly of such as trust in external observances of any kind to compensate for their want of love to god and man it shows that nothing can profit which does not spring from repentance and faith and is not attended with a sober righteous and godly life and that externals may safely be omitted or postponed when the exercise of mercy and kindness to our brethren requires it verse seven margin they have transgressed the covenant which i solemnly contracted with them just as adam did in paradise loath the israelites had also renounced jehovah for base idols as a wife treacherously forsakes her husband for strangers verses eight and nine ramoth gilead beyond jordan was one of the cities of refuge and allotted to the priests but it was totally given up to wickedness and polluted with murder the company of priests also that dwelt there was a mere banditti consenting together in robbery murder and every enormity standing by each other in doing and vindicating their evil deeds margin the hebrew word avon translated iniquity frequently signifies idolatry and the blood which gilead is said to have been polluted with may mean the blood of their children which they sacrifice to moloch dr wells interprets it of those gileadites who assisted pekka in the murder of pekka here two kings fifteen verse twenty five the phrase translated here polluted with blood literally signifies with bloody footsteps being taken from such as are found with their shoes stained with the blood they have shed one kings two verse five loath the word rendered by consent seems to mean towards shechem the priests beset the road to shechem as robbers and murderers verse ten an horrible thing such an apostasy from god as cannot be mentioned without horror loath the idolatry begun by jeroboam of the tribe of ephraim had opened the way for all the subsequent abominations by which the kingdom of israel was polluted he made israel to sin verse eleven the seeds of idolatry from israel had been sown plenteously in judah and thus he that is israel or ephraim had prepared a harvest for judah also the nation was become ripe for divine judgments which would be inflicted by the assyrians and chaldeans until the time when god would turn away the captivity of his people psalm fourteen verse seven fifty three verse six a hundred and twenty six verse one when i would have turned away the captivity of my people when i would upon their repentance have averted my judgments which will end in their captivity loath among those who lead away the captivity of my people bishop newcomb this translation requires only a trivial change of the pointing practical observations in all our troubles we should place our whole confidence in the lord's mercy and should take warning and encouragement to return to him and exhort others to do the same he afflicts us in providence that we may look to him to restore our prosperity he convinces and humbles our hearts by his holy spirit and often fills the conscience with remorse and dismay in order to prepare us for the healing balm of his salvation and the consolations which he bestows on the contrite believer no affliction or temptation therefore no guilt or power of sin no wounded spirit or terrified conscience should induce us to despair of help and comfort from god he may suffer us for a time to be seized on with the sorrows of death or the pains of hell and to be like those that go down into the pit but as he raised the redeemer from the grave so will he revive the hearts and hopes of all that trust in him and cause them at length to walk before him and to rejoice in his manifested presence and love let us then begin and follow on to know the lord that we may experience the freeness and efficacy of his grace the faithfulness of his promises and the felicity of his people the feeblest glimpse of hope in his word which draws upon the humbled sin distressed soul is a sure earnest of increasing light and comfort till the sun of righteousness shall arise upon him with healing in his wings and till he shall arrive in the presence above and possess the fullness of knowledge purity love and joy for evermore increasing light and hope shall be afforded to the waiting soul with showers of purifying fertilizing and comforting grace and he who sent the former will send the latter rain also and perfect the good work that he hath begun 
but we have not the same reason to depend on our own resolutions, convictions, or hopeful beginnings, as we have to trust in the truth and mercy of our God. Alas, these are as mutable as the others are unchangeable. Under the rod of affliction, under terrors of conscience, or under the awakening word of some Boagines, many seem deeply impressed and well disposed to religion, but when the restraint, the scourge, the terror is removed, their transient goodness vanishes like an empty cloud, or is exhaled by temptation as the dew by the burning sun, and we mourn our disappointed expectations respecting them. What shall be done with such persons? For if any man draw back, the Lord will have no pleasure in him. Or what shall he do to us who are prone to a similar, if not an equal, inconstancy? May he put his fear into our hearts, and set up his kingdom within us, and never, never more leave us to ourselves, or suffer us to be overcome by temptation. Obstinate transgressors must not expect soothing messages from a holy God. He will hew them by the words of his prophets, and if this do not prevail to bring down to the dust of self-abasement, he will slay them by the words of his mouth, and by executing his threatened vengeance on them, convince them of the truth of his holy word. All oblations and external services are mere pride and hypocrisy, whilst justice, mercy, truth, and piety are neglected, and that confidence, even in the sacrifice of Christ, is mere presumption which encourages any one to continue in sin. If men had the true knowledge of God, they could not be so deluded, and if they were partakers of true faith, they could not but hate sin and uprightly fear, love, obey, and serve the Lord. But under every dispensation men prove themselves the children of Adam by breaking the law and abusing the mercy and goodness of God. The most favoured places become most notorious for sin. The most sacred offices are often filled by the vilest of men. No tongue can express what horrible defilements God sees continually even in his visible church. But whilst multitudes are ripening for destruction, a time is coming when he will return the captivity of his people and fill the earth with his glory and then Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall abound in songs of grateful praise. Chapter 7 Heavy Charges of Atrocious Crimes Against the Kings, Nobles, and People of Israel, verses 1-10, to 10, and Awful Denunciations of the Wrath of God Against Them, verses 11-16. to 16. Verse 1 When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they did commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. Verse 2. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. Verse 3. They make the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. Verse 4. They are all adulterers, as an oven heated by the baker, who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. Verse 5. In the day of our king the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. Verse 6. For they have made ready their heart like an oven, while they lie in wait. Their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. Verse 7. They are all hot as an oven, and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. Verse 8. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Verse 9. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, grey hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. Verse 10. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Verse 11, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Verse 12, When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them, as their congregation hath heard. Verse 13, Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Verse 14, and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. They assemble themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. Verse 15. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. Verse 16. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Notes. Verses 1-3. to three the labours of Elijah, Elisha, and many other prophets, 
the ruin of Ahab's idolatrous family by Jehu, who destroyed Baal out of Israel, and all that succession of mercies and warnings which the Lord continued to them, were means used for their healing, but they eventually served the more to discover the extreme wickedness of all ranks of men, especially in Samaria, where fraud, violence, and robbery were perpetrated in the most atrocious manner. For they never seriously considered that God noted and remembered against them all their wickedness, not even when the effects of their crimes beset them about and caused them manifold distresses. But as their kings and princes were given up to idolatry and other wickedness, the people were glad to oblige them by conforming to their false worship, copying their vices and lavishing flattering encomiums upon them, with which they were highly gratified and rendered bolder in wickedness. The succession of kings from Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, to the prophet's time may be intended. Verse 4. The whole company were adulterers as well as idolaters, and were most eagerly bent upon the indulgence of their unlawful lusts. Their hearts were inflamed with sensual desires like a heated oven. Satan or his agents had kindled this fire, and they cherished and kept it burning, waiting for the opportunity of gratifying it without regard to duty or decency. The tempter had only to prepare them the occasion of sin, as the baker prepares the dough for the heated oven, and they were ready to seize upon it margin, he will cease from waking after, etc., margin. The baker may take his rest till the dough be ready, 6 and 7. Verses 5 to 7. On the king's birthday or coronation day, or some other public occasion when he made a royal feast, his nobles tempted him to drink to the most shameful excess, making him sick with bottles of wine, or the heat of wine, and when he was thus intoxicated, he stretched out his hand with scorners, treated everything sacred with the most impious contempt, and perhaps employed his authority to persecute the worshippers of Jehovah. Some recent and notorious act of contempt to God or to his prophets, or to public justice, is here alluded to. Bishop Newcomb. Thus they prepared themselves and each other for every daring wickedness, and perhaps some of them had their hearts inflamed with ambition and revenge, and lay in wait for that opportunity to murder the drunken king and usurp his throne. Their furious passions rendered Satan's temptations unnecessary. Their baker might sleep all the night, and in the morning find his oven as hot as he could wish it, that is, their hearts as ready for any wickedness as could be desired. For, being heated with wine and sinful passions, they murdered their magistrates and kings one after another, yet neither the people nor any one of their kings amid these distractions and miseries would seek help from God. Notes 2 Kings 15 and 16. Verses 8 to 10. Ephraim, or the kingdom of the ten tribes, had intimately connected himself with the surrounding nations by alliances, intermarriages, and communion in idolatry, yet he still pretended to worship Jehovah. Thus he became a cake not turned, half burnt and half dough, and none of it fit for use, a motley mixture of idolatry and the worship of God. But he was eager in iniquity, and lukewarm in religion, and partial in every attempt to reform. The strange gods and heathen alliances weakened him continually, and the neighbouring nations by hostile invasions devoured his strength, yet he perceived no danger, and never suspected the cause of his decay, namely that the hand of God was lifted up against him. In short, he had as evident tokens of approaching ruin as grey hairs are of old age, and of the decay of the constitution, and the prophets evidently saw these symptoms and pointed them out to him, but he took no notice. This arose from his pride, which openly testified against him, seeing neither judgments, warnings, nor mercies could induce him to return and seek the Lord. Verses 11 and 12. In another view of this subject, the conduct of Ephraim might be likened to that of a dove. Ephraim was become like a silly dove, not in innocence and gentleness, but in folly and timorousness, having neither understanding, courage, nor resolution. He was frightened at every appearance of danger, but instead of fleeing to the Lord for refuge, as the doves fly to their windows, he was like the silly dove that flieth here and there for safety till she is taken in the fowler's net. Sometimes he applied to the Assyrians, and sometimes to the Egyptians, without prudence or prospect of safety, and thus he would be entangled in the net which the Lord had spread for him, and be overtaken with inevitable ruin, as the fowls are ensnared and destroyed by the fowler for God would certainly punish them, as the congregation of Israel had repeatedly heard from the prophets, 
and especially as had been foretold in the books of Moses. When they hearken to their assembly, when they are swayed by the counsel of their assembly to seek foreign assistance, Bishop Newcomb, verses 13 to 16, deserved ruin must come upon the people, seeing they had not only transgressed against God, but fled from him who alone could pardon and save them. Though he had often redeemed them from their enemies, yet they had spoken lies against him, as if he were a severe master, and his service hard and unprofitable, or they had mocked him with hypocritical professions of repentance, even when on the bed of sickness or death, or labouring under heavy afflictions, they howled out for anguish and terror, and vented their bitter and impatient complaints before God, they did not cry to him with their hearts, they did not humble themselves before him, or expect help from him. At least they did not intend to return to his service, but only cried out like the unclean spirit, torment me not, in a mixture of horror and enmity. When they met together to pray for a favourable harvest or vintage, they only sought these things to consume on their lusts, and persisted at the very time in rebellion against God. James 4, verses 1 to 3. And when the Lord chastised them, and afterwards bound up their wounds and strengthened them, they still devised more rebellion and wickedness against him. Even when they seemed to repent and turn to him, they only left Baal to worship the golden calves, or they rested in some form of external reformation, and never came up to true repentance, faith, spiritual worship, or holy obedience. They deceived every expectation formed of them, like a broken or a useless bow in the day of battle. Their princes, therefore, would, one after another, perish by the sword, for their daring impieties and revilings of God's prophets, and their miseries would excite the derision of the Egyptians, on whom they had depended for protection against the Assyrians. Practical Observations, verses 1 to 10 the means used to bring sinners to repentance and salvation, whether by the labours of God's ministers, or providential dispensations, only serve to detect and aggravate their wickedness, except they be accompanied with his special blessing. The whole salvation of the righteous is therefore of the Lord, but the condemnation of the wicked is of themselves, and justly deserved. Men commit numerous and heinous crimes without reflection, recollection, or remorse, because they consider not that the Lord remembers all their wickedness, and will produce the whole of it as evidence against them, and show all the world the justice of their punishment by discovering the malignity of their crimes. Alas, how poor an object do men attain who ingratiate themselves with ungodly kings and nobles by wickedness and lies! and thus expose themselves to the wrath of God, and even increase the condemnation of their wicked patrons. The depraved hearts of men and the temptations of Satan are as congenial as fire and fuel, and concur in preparing sinners for the practice of every crime, and want of opportunity, ability, or courage prevents more wickedness than perhaps all other causes combined, so that the open and even the secret enormities of men's lives, atrocious as they are, bear a very small proportion to the desperate wickedness of their hearts. But when lust is inwardly conceived and cherished, it will more or less break forth into outward sin. He who first suggests the idea of forbidden indulgence will assist in devising the means of gratification, and then sinners will proceed without further temptation, having made ready their hearts like an oven, whilst they lie in wait for the opportunity." Thus adulteries, murders, and all horrible crimes are perpetrated without hesitation or remorse when they can be done with present impunity. Days of public festivity are commonly attended with much wickedness and followed with many fatal effects. Intoxication leads men to every kind of impiety and immorality, but what an infamy is it for a king to be made sick with bottles of wine and to be a companion and an example to scorners and blasphemers? They who tempt rulers to such a degrading vice can never be their friends, and not unfrequently the event shows that they were plotting their ruin, and that they were lying in wait with hearts full of malice or ambition to murder both body and soul by an exquisite refinement in cruelty. Whilst men thus execute the vengeance of God on each other, how seldom do those that witness such transactions call upon God, who alone can preserve them from being involved in similar ruin. Thus nations ripen for destruction, and such as are called Christians often differ in nothing from pagans, except in the worthless attempt to form a coalition between religion and the world, that is, between God and the devil. But we are so blind to ourselves that neither nations, churches, nor individuals can see, 
in their own case, those symptoms of decay and approaching ruin which are visible to all around them. The same pride that emboldens men to break the law of God leads them to self-flattery and to continue impenitent amidst the rebukes of providence and the warnings of his word. They will not return to the Lord nor seek him for all this. Verses 11 to 16. When sinners are terrified and driven from one scheme to another for safety, they are so devoid of understanding that the mercy and grace of God are frequently the only refuge to which they never think of fleeing but whatever other expedients they have recourse to, the Lord will take them in his net and execute upon them those judgments of which all his congregations have heard. Woe then be to those transgressors who attempt to flee from God, for in this way destruction is inevitable. But to him, as the Redeemer of Israel, the chief of sinners may approach with acceptance, and they who perish in their sins speak lies against him if they charge their ruin either on his secret purposes or his refusal to have mercy on them. Yet numbers, when in deep distress they howl forth their terrors in the form of prayers, do not cry to God with their hearts for the blessings of his complete salvation. Even their prayers for temporal mercies only require provision for their lusts, and are united with rebellion. Whether God afflict and weaken, or bind up and strengthen them, they continue to devise mischief against him. Their very repentance and conversion from one sect, sentiment, form, or vice to another, leave them far short of conversion to Christ and holiness, for they return but not to the Most High, and rest in some plausible scheme of hypocrisy or false religion. When they speak fair, their professions are deceitful, but when they vent outrageous blasphemies and lies, their tongues agree with their hearts, and their destruction will be attended with the derision and contempt of their tempters and companions in iniquity. Such is human nature, such is the progress and end of impiety, such shall we prove if left to ourselves. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Chapter 8 Reproofs of Israel's idolatry, hypocrisy, rebellion, and folly, and denunciations of deserved punishment, in which Judah also is joined. Verses 1 to 14 Verse 1 Set the trumpet to thy mouth, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant, and trespassed against my law. Verse 2. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Verse 3. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. Verse 4. They have set up kings, but not by me, they have made princes, and I knew it not, of their silver and their gold, have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Verse 5. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be, ere they attain to innocency? Verse 6. For from Israel was it also, the workmen made it, therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Verse 7. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Verse 9. For they are gone to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. Verse 10. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Verse 11. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. Verse 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Verse 13, they sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins, they shall return to Egypt. Verse 14, for Israel hath forgotten his maker, and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fences, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Notes Verse 1. The prophet, as Israel's watchman, was commanded to blow the trumpet, and give warning of the coming of the Assyrian king with speed and violence, like an eagle, against the people among whom God had dwelt, because they had now provoked him by violating his covenant to depart from them. Give notice of the approaching enemy. Verse 8 who is coming with speed and fierceness like a bird of prey against the city and temple of Jerusalem. By the house of the Lord, 
may be meant God's people in general, whom he formerly took care of as his own family. Chapter 9, verse 15. This may probably denote Sennacherib's invasion. Loth. This verse may be considered as a general warning to Judah as well as Israel, though the following verses are immediately addressed to the ten tribes. Verses 2-4. to four. When Israel should be hard-pressed by the Assyrians, they would claim a relation to God and profess to put themselves under his protection as a people that had known and worshipped him. But their pretensions would be disregarded, for they had cast off him that is good, or that which is good. They had forsaken the Lord and his temple and worship. They had despised the prophets and trampled on his law by their idolatries and iniquities, and this for many ages. Therefore their enemy would pursue and prevail against them. They had set up kings and princes of their own choosing, in opposition to his chosen race, the family of David, when they revolted from Rehoboam, and through all succeeding generations they never consulted their heavenly king about the appointment of their earthly kings, and both they and their kings and princes had employed their treasures in making idols, as if on purpose to provoke God to cut them off. Verses 5 and 6. The calf of Samaria, or that place at Bethel, in the kingdom of which Samaria was the capital, could not protect its worshippers, but would cast them off, when they were left in the hands of the Assyrians, who seized upon their idol also. Remove far from thee thy calf, O Samaria, Bishop Newcomb. And how long would it be ere they cleared themselves of this idolatry? Did they never intend it? The whole of that worship was Israel's invention from the time when the golden calf was made in the wilderness, contrary to the express command of God. The workmen made the idol, and it could neither be God nor any proper representation of him, but a mere dead image of a calf that would soon be broken to pieces. Verses 7 and 8 At the expense and trouble of the people in their worship and all their crimes, politics, and heathen alliances by which they attempted to secure themselves were only sowing the wind, and if they had any increase they could only reap the whirlwind. Such seed could produce nothing valuable, and if a little transient prosperity seemed to result from it, it would soon be torn from them by strangers who would swallow them up with their property, and they would be left among the nations as a broken or mean vessel which a man throws away or uses for the basest purposes. Verses 9 and 10. When the Assyrians attacked the Israelites, they applied for help to the kings of Assyria, and they ran about as a headstrong wild ass when separated from his companions. At a vast expense they hired the assistance of idolaters, and conformed to their mode of worship. But though they seemed to have obtained their purpose, and to have engaged powerful allies, yet the Lord would gather them together against them as their enemies, and would begin to punish them by the burden or tribute laid on them by the king of Assyria, who called himself a king of princes. Yet this would be a light affliction compared with those that would follow. Verses 11 and 12 the Israelites, having, in the days of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, forsaken the temple and altar at Jerusalem, erected altars at Bethel and Dan, and at several other places, both to the golden calves and to Baal, etc., as if they had purposely intended to add sin to sin. Therefore their altars and sacrifices would be imputed to them as aggravated crimes, and expose them to just and dreadful punishment. The Lord had caused the great and important truths and requirements of his law, respecting him and the worship and service which he required, to be written for their instruction, and he had sent his prophets to enforce it upon the people, but they continued to treat it as a strange thing. They knew scarcely anything of it, they disregarded and despised it, and adhered to their own devices. Thus the idolaters count the word of God as strange in respect of their own inventions. Alas, in how many places, even among Protestants, is a minister who inculcates the great doctrines of Christianity, as stated in the Reformation, accused of preaching a new religion and bringing strange things to the ears of the people. Verse 13. The people professed to sacrifice unto God while they made void his commandments, that they might keep their own traditions. But the feast which they made on the sacrifice was their sole advantage, for the Lord, instead of accepting their worship, was determined to punish their obstinate disobedience and idolatry, and to reduce them to as grievous a bondage as their fathers had endured in Egypt. Going into Egypt was a proverbial speech for extreme misery. Loath. Verse 14. When the Israelites were wholly forgetful of God, and regardless of his authority, they erected temples to the golden calves and to other idols. Judah also, instead of confiding in the Lord, multiplied fenced cities as their security against invaders. 
Thus both Israel and Judah were provoking God to pour out his judgments upon them, which would soon destroy their cities, temples, and palaces, as by one general conflagration. Practical Observations Great earnestness and boldness are especially required when ministers are called to warn degenerate professors of religion of approaching ruin and exhort them to repent of transgressing God's law and despising his covenant. In times of great danger, and especially in the day of judgment, many will say, My God, we know thee, and Lord, Lord, open to us, to whom he will answer, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. For evil will overtake all that cast off that which is good, and rest in a mere form of godliness. No comfort can be expected in any of the relations of life which we form without consulting God. Good rulers, masters or servants, as well as more intimate relatives, should be sought from him and valued as his gift. Nor can we expect success in any undertaking, even in our temporal concerns, in which we do not acknowledge him, and seek to know and do his will. They who covetously idolize gold and silver are nearly as criminal as they were who formerly made images of them to worship, and in various ways men act as if they were bent upon their own ruin. All our carnal confidences will one day fail us, because we provoke God to jealousy by putting them in his place. But how long will it be, ere we, any of us, attain unto innocency and renounce all our idols? No human inventions can form an essential part of our religious worship, any more than the work of the carpenter or goldsmith can be a god. Let us then not be deceived. What a man sows, that also shall he reap, and they who sow vanity shall reap destruction and confusion. No good can come from impiety, idolatry, and wickedness, whatever pains or expense men bestow upon them, and the transient prosperity of fools will not only soon terminate, but it will destroy them. Apostates will be confounded in punishment with other evildoers, except as they will be more disgraced than they, and become among ungodly men, as a vessel in which the Lord hath no pleasure. Men are often more brutish than the most stupid of the animals, and more obstinate than the most untractable. They are so enslaved to their vile affections that they pay very dear for the gratification of them even in this world. But this is only a little sorrow compared with the punishment prepared for them hereafter. So long as men despise the truths and precepts of God's written word, and count the mysteries of his nature, the demands of his law, the doctrines of his gospel, and the ordinances of his worship a strange thing, all the observances and costly oblations of their own devising will be unto them for sin. For the Lord accepteth nothing which is not done in faith, and he will remember and punish the sins of all men except those of the true believer. And whether they who forget God multiply temples or palaces or castles, they can by no means secure themselves against the wrath of that righteous judge whose justice they have provoked, and whose salvation they have neglected, despised, or abused. Chapter 9 of Hosea from the Holy Bible with Original Notes by Thomas Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Israel is sentenced to a variety of miseries for their aggravated sins, but especially their idolatry, Verses 1 to 17. Verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy, as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God, thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. Verse 2. The floor and the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. Verse 3. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Verse 4, They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. Verse 5, What will ye do in the solemn day, and the day of the feast of the Lord? Verse 6, For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up, Memphis shall bury them, the pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them, thorns shall be in their tabernacles. Verse 7. The days of visitation are come, the days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool, the spiritual man is mad, for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. Verse 8. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. Verse 9, they have deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gebir. 
Therefore, he will remember their iniquity, and he will visit their sins. Verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor, and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. Verse 11, As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird, from the birth, and from the womb, and from the conception. Verse 12, Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them, that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. Verse 13, Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Verse 14. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Verse 15. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Verse 16. Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Verse 17. My God will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Notes Verses 1-3 to three. Thou shalt not rejoice for joy, etc., Perhaps the Israelites were joyfully celebrating some public success or gathering in their vintage or harvest when the prophet published this message to them. They had no right to rejoice as Judah had, where were still considerable remains of true religion, or even as other nations which had not forsaken God in so aggravated a manner, or been guilty of such deep contempt or so base and ungrateful an apostasy as they had. Their prosperity, therefore, would be more transient and ruinous than that of other nations, for, like an adulterous woman, they had violated their covenant with God, and preferred the most worthless idols to Him. They loved even to receive the fruits of the earth, as from these their paramours, as festivals in honour of their idols were more suited to their state of heart than presenting the sacrifices of thanksgiving to God, and honouring Him with their substance. Chapter 2, verse 12. He therefore would visit them with famine, so that their corn floor and wine press would not suffice for their support, instead of supplying their luxurious revels, and the new wine would lie to her by disappointing her expectations, that is, those of the nation considered as a harlot. Nay, the people would not be allowed to inhabit the Lord's favoured and good land, where he deigned to dwell among his worshippers. Some of them would migrate into Egypt either in the time of famine or when pressed by the Assyrians, the rest would be carried into Assyria, and there be constrained to live on food that was ceremoniously unclean, or even refuse and vile, being pressed with extreme necessity. Verses 4 to 6. The Israelites would have no opportunity of pouring out wine offerings to the Lord, nor any wine to do it with, neither could they present any acceptable service, or have any communion with him, as the word may signify, their sacrifices would be either totally interrupted, or would be as the bread of mourners, who being unclean could not eat of the holy things without violating the law. The showbread would no longer be presented in the house of the Lord in their behalf, nor sacrifices offered for them. And what would they do on their solemn feasts when both the spiritual and carnal joy of them had ceased? For the prophet, as it were, beheld and saw the people gone out of the land, to avoid impending destruction, and they would be collected together into Egypt to die and be buried there, whilst their pleasant places, which were decorated or filled with silver, as well as their other more humble tabernacles, would soon be overgrown with nettles and thorns. Verses 7 and 8 The prophets had long foretold these days of visitation and retribution, and Israel would soon know the truth of their predictions, though they now counted the prophet a fool and the inspired servant of God a madman because of their extreme depravity and enmity to the Lord and his cause. Or the event would show their false prophets and pretenders to inspiration to have been fools and madmen, to whose delusions God had given up Israel to punish the multitude of their crimes and their great hatred of him. The prophet observed that the watchmen of Ephraim, as Elijah, Elisha, Micaiah, etc., had communed with his God, had him with them in their work, and wrought with him in turning many to righteousness, but these nominal watchmen or prophets 
were in all their ways like the snare of a fowler to entangle men to their ruin as they increased the people's hatred of god and his worship and thus brought down vengeance upon themselves and them by their idolatry or hypocrisy the marginal reading hatred against the house of his god gives the clearer sense some give another turn to the phrase ye falsely imagined that these prophets of ephraim were sent of god and had familiar acquaintance with him but ye shall find them to be as the snare of a fowler bishop hall verses nine and ten notes judges nineteen to twenty one the people of all the tribes of Israel were become as deeply corrupted as the men of Gibeah who abused and murdered the Levite's concubine, or those of the tribe of Benjamin, who defended the perpetrators of that detestable crime, and so were almost wholly cut off, and in like manner God would remember and visit the crimes of the generation to whom the prophet spake. Indeed, Israel, in his first and best days, just before his entrance into Canaan, were as pleasing to God as grapes would be to a weary traveller in the parched desert, or as the first ripe figs, when being scarce they are the more valued, yet even when the nation thus followed the Lord in the wilderness, a multitude of them were seduced by the Midianitish women to frequent the temple of Baal Peor, and to separate themselves from God's ordinances unto that shameful idolatry, and that abominable whoredom which they loved better than the spiritual and holy worship of Jehovah. The Hebrew word, Yenazahu, were separated, alludes to the order of the Nazarites who were in a peculiar manner set apart for God's service. Whereas these dedicated themselves to the service of that filthy idol, Baal Peor. Besheth, shame, was a nickname for Baal. So Jerob Baal is called Jerob Besheth, 2 Samuel 11 verse 21. Note Judges 6 verse 31 and 32. Verses 11 to 14. Ephraim signifies fruitfulness, and the vast number to which this tribe had increased was its peculiar glory. By this distinction the Ephraimites seemed to have been greatly elated, but it was about to fly away, speedily and irrecoverably, as a bird let loose. Their children would die as soon as they were born, or be stillborn or abortions, by which the nation would be gradually enfeebled and diminished, and of the small number that should grow up to maturity, the Lord would so bereave them by various judgments that there could be scarcely any left of them, for nothing but misery could ensue when God had been provoked to depart from them in anger and to deprive them of his gracious presence and protection. Indeed, Ephraim had been as prosperous and replenished and as pleasantly situated as even the flourishing city of Tyre, which excited the admiration of all beholders, but from this time they would bring forth and educate children merely to be butchered by their enemies so that the prophet scarcely knew what to ask in their behalf, or could only entreat the Lord to give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts, as a less calamity than bringing forth children for the murderer, or to be trained up in idolatry. Verses 15 to 17. Gilgal, where their fathers first covenanted with God, after they had entered the promised land, and where his tabernacle once stood before it was removed to Shiloh, Joshua 5, verses 9 and 10, chapter 10, verse 41, was, at the time when the prophet wrote, become the repository of all kinds of idolatry and iniquity, whence they were diffused through the land on each side of Jordan. Therefore the Lord abhorred them and resolved to drive them out of his house as an adulterous woman when divorced. Note chapter 4 verse 15. Nor would he any more love them or especially favour them, seeing all their princes were revolters, rebels, and apostates, Indeed, the calamities were begun, their root was dried up, and their fruit would wither. When the Israelites were sentenced to fall in the wilderness, their children were preserved to inherit the promised land, but as Ephraim was to be finally rejected, even the beloved fruit of the womb would be slain with their parents, as those of the Canaanites had been. God had determined to cast them off, because they would not hearken to him, and the remnant of them would be scattered as wanderers among the nations. This was soon after fulfilled respecting the kingdom of the ten tribes, and continues so to this day, and even such of them, as were incorporated with the Jews, have with them been wanderers among the nations for many hundred years. Notes chapter 5. It is wonderful that these prophecies, so often repeated and so exactly descriptive of the present state of that favoured nation, after many revolving ages, 
do not more impress the minds of those who read them with admiration of the full knowledge of God and full conviction of the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. Practical Observations, verses 1 to 10. They who abide under the wrath of God and continue to accumulate guilt and condemnation can have no cause to rejoice in temporal prosperity, but such as apostatize from the religion of pious ancestors, violate their own solemn engagements, and run into wickedness, in opposition to the convictions of their consciences and the strivings of God's Spirit with them, have less reason for joy than any other sinners, for to them belongs the deepest condemnation abundance received as the reward of serving mammon or abused in making provision for men's lusts will end either in most ruinous prosperity or most distressing calamities they whose pampered bodies are rendered unclean by their unlawful indulgences may perhaps be reduced to the necessity of eating the most unclean and unwholesome food through the extremity of indigence but no famine is so dreadful as that of the soul Awful is the case of those who can perform no acceptable service to the Lord, but must either utterly neglect him, or render him such worship as he abhors. Yet, in this case, we should all have been, had not the Son of God, by his incarnation, atonement, and intercession, opened us a door of access and acceptance through faith in his name. Men may now despise the solemn days and ordinances of God, and disrelish every feast that cannot gratify their sensuality but the utter want of every means of grace and hope of mercy will make them know their value. And what will they then do? Thus multitudes hurry on to destruction, their bodies are gathered into the grave, their souls sink into hopeless misery, and their pleasant places for their silver, as well as their commodious habitations, if not covered with thorns and nettles, yet pass into the hands of those who neither know nor care what is become of them. But the ministers of God, who foresee and openly declare these approaching days of visitation and recompense, must expect to be reviled as wild enthusiasts, or as weak and foolish men, for God leaves sinners under delusion because of the greatness of their crimes and their enmity against Him. But if carnal men deem the servants of God fools and madmen, these know, and can prove them and their flattering teachers to be so. Happy are they that have watchmen placed over them, who walk with God, seek His glory, do His work, and enjoy His assistance and blessing. Many such there have been, and are. May the Lord increase their numbers and prosper their labours. But more have been found crafty and selfish, ensnaring men in error and iniquity, and misleading them into the ways of ruin for their own mercenary ends, increasing men's hatred of God and of each other, and thus disturbing and defiling even the house of God. Alas, many parts of the church are as corrupted as Benjamin was in the days of Gebir, and may expect similar visitations. At some times, and in some places, a people are formed by divine grace, who are peculiarly delightful to our holy God, but then a falling off commonly succeeds, and some separate themselves to this shame and others to that, according to the different abominations which they have loved. Thus they go out from true believers, because they were not of them and their glory soon vanishes and appears no more. Verses 11 to 17 How soon could our God insensibly waste the most populous nations, and what an alloy it is to our comfort in our beloved children to reflect for what purposes they may be brought up and reserved. This is a sore vanity, but submission and confidence in God and a conscientious performance of our duty form the best remedy of it. Surely it is far more desirable to be written childless than to bring up families in the service of sin and Satan, and they who provoke God to depart from them can reasonably expect nothing but woe for themselves and their offspring here and hereafter. The Lord will drive wicked and hypocritical professors with abhorrence out of his house and love them no more. His wrath dries up the root and withers the fruit of all our comforts, and the poor scattered Jews, whom God hath cast off, because they did not hearken to him, and whom he hath condemned to be wanderers among the nations, are a daily warning to us to beware, lest we neglect or abuse his gospel. For how then could we escape a similar, or even a more terrible, condemnation? Chapter 10 Reproofs of Israel's Manifold Sins Denunciations of Terrible Judgments and Exhortations to Repentance, verses 1 to 15 verse 1. 
Israel is an empty vine, he bringeth forth fruit unto himself, according to the multitude of his fruit he hath increased the altars, according to the goodness of his land they have made goodly images. Verse 2. Their heart is divided, now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars, he shall spoil their images. Verse 3. For now they shall say, We have no king, because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? Verse 4. They have spoken words, swearing falsely in making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Verse 5. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth-Avon, for the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. Verse 6. For it shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jareb. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Verse 7. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. Verse 8. The high places also of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills fall on us. Verse 9. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gebir. There they stood. The battle in Gebir against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Verse 10. It is in my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them, when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. Verse 11. And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught, and loveth to tread out the corn. But I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plough, and Jacob shall break his clods. Verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Verse 13. Ye have ploughed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. Verse 14. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled as Shalman spoiled Beth Abel in the day of battle. The mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. Verse 15. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Notes. Verses 1 to 3. Israel had often been compared to a vine which is valuable only for its fruit, but the nation was become an empty vine which brought no fruit to perfection, they not only spent their abundance on themselves, but even their apparent good works sprang from ostentation or other selfish motives, and not from regard to the glory and will of God. As they were enriched by the produce of their good land, they multiplied altars and images which had a goodly show of devotion, but were an abomination to the Lord. They vainly attempted to divide their hearts between him and idols, which were his rivals, and thus they were found guilty of violating the covenant of God, and of forfeiting all the blessings of their relation to him. By the Assyrians he would certainly destroy their altars and images, and they should be left without any king to head or protect them, and be forced to confess that, because they had not feared the Lord, no king could do anything effectual to preserve them from ruin. A king cannot protect us if God be against us. Loath. Notes 2 Kings 15 Verse 4 the Israelites, in professing to covenant with God, or make vows to him, spake lies, and joined perjury to hypocrisy. In swearing allegiance to their princes, they concealed the most treacherous intentions, and all their civil compacts and decisions were conducted with fraud and perjury. Thus even the administration of justice, as it should have been, sprang up like pestiferous hemlock in the furrows of the field, and tended to diffuse still more widely deceit, injustice, impiety, and misery throughout the whole land. Verses 5 and 6. The inhabitants of Samaria would be seized with terror when they heard that the golden calves which had been worshipped at Bethel and Dan were carried off by the invaders or given as tribute to the Assyrian king. The people would regret the loss of their idols, but the priests, who had rejoiced in the emolument and credit which they had derived from that idolatry, would have more substantial cause for mourning when their gains and their glory were all taken away together. For the gold of the calves would be sent to the king of Assyria as a present, or a part of the spoil, of the conquered nation, 
and this would turn to the shame of the doting idolaters, who took counsel to worship dead images which could not protect themselves in preference to the living, true, and almighty God. The word rendered priests is chemerim. These were certain idolatrous priests who were clothed in black when they offered sacrifices. Jareb, note chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. There it probably means tiglath Pileser, unto whom Menahem betook himself for safety, and here it seems to denote Shalmaneser, who took the Israelites under his protection by making them tributaries. Loath. Verses 7 and 8. Perhaps Hoshea, the last king of Israel, was here meant. After various revolutions and interregnums, that kingdom seemed in a hopeful way of regaining tranquillity and prosperity under his government, but these promising appearances resembled those airy bubbles that form the foam on the top of the water, and they soon vanished and came to nothing by the slaughter of the king. Then the high places of Avon or Beth Avon would be destroyed, and whilst thorns and thistles overgrew their desolated altars, the terrified worshippers would call upon the hills and mountains to crush or cover them from impending and more tremendous vengeance. Verses 9 to 11. The disposition of Israel had, in succeeding ages, resembled that of the Benjaminites in the days of Gibeah. Note chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. The men of Gibeah stood to what they had done, and the Benjaminites stood by them in it. And thus Israel had always obstinately persisted in the most atrocious abominations. Though the last battle in Gibeah almost destroyed the tribe of Benjamin, yet it did not overtake and extirpate the children of iniquity, for many still remained from age to age in Israel to copy that vile example. The Lord had therefore formed a determined purpose to punish them. The people of Assyria, with their allies, would gather at his call against them, when by their idolatry they had bound themselves for slavery, as the oxen are confined to labour up and down the two furrows of the field. The worship of the calves at Dan and Bethel seems to be intended. Margin. Ephraim indeed was like a heifer who had been taught and loved to tread out the corn, which was not hard labour and was attended with the liberty of eating it. That is, the Israelites loved the privilege and temporal advantages of being the people of God, but they were not disposed to labour or self-denial in his service. By milder discipline God had attempted to train them to obedience, as the husbandman gently causes the yoke to pass upon the fair neck of the young heifer to prepare her for the work, but as that did not effect the purpose, he would reduce them to great hardships like those endured by beasts of burden, and even Judah and the whole house of Jacob would be brought into bondage by the Assyrians and Chaldeans, as if they were set to plough and to break the clods, seeing they had quarrelled with the easy yoke of God's commands. Verses 12 to 13 no way remained to the Israelites and Jews of escaping these judgments except by sowing to themselves in righteousness. Repentance and conversion from sin, attendance on God's ordinances and obedience to his commandments, would be like sowing good seed which would yield an increase for their own advantage, and in this way, though they could not merit anything from God, they might hope and wait for his merciful acceptance as their harvest. But their hearts resembled fallow ground, hard and unbroken, and covered with noxious weeds, so that, unless they were humbled and broken for sin, and cleansed from vile affections, they could not receive the good seed of God's word, nor bring forth the fruits of righteousness, but self-examination, watchfulness, prayer, confession, and mortification of sin would break up this fallow ground, and eradicate these weeds. They had too long delayed this needful duty, and it was full time for them to seek the Lord, and his favour and help, by earnest prayer, Thus they might expect that he would give the increase by the influences of his spirit, and come and rain righteousness upon them. But on the contrary, they had long bestowed abundant pains in the practice of wickedness, as if they had ploughed and sowed in order to get a crop of iniquity, and in consequence they had eaten the fruit of their own lies and hypocrisy. They trusted in their own projects, and heathen alliances, and in numerous and valiant forces, but as they had neglected God and his service, these confidences would certainly fail them. Verses 14 to 15. Intestine divisions and foreign invaders would soon combine to ruin Israel. All their strongholds would fall into the hands of the enemy, and their inhabitants would be treated with the same cruelty with which Shalman, or Shalmaneser, had desolated Beth Arbel, 
when he took it by assault and slew indiscriminately all the inhabitants. Nor could Bethel and its idols do anything for them better than this, for it was the source and substance of their enormous wickedness, and after a night of adversity, when they thought the morning of prosperity was come under the government of Hoshea, he would suddenly be cut off and the whole people left defenceless in the hands of their enemies. Beth Arbel, or Arbela, was a place in Armenia, famous afterwards for the defeat of Darius by Alexander. The Hebrew reads, because of the evil of your evil. That language expresses the greatness of anything by repeating the word over again. The same expression is used by St. Paul, Romans 7 verse 13, that sin might become exceedingly sinful. That is, hereby it might appear how full of evil our natural corruption is. Loath. Practical Observations they who only seek their own credit or profit in religious duties will be accounted unfruitful branches of the true vine, for all who abide in Christ bring forth fruit to the glory of God and the benefit of mankind. Alas, in this view, how empty a vine is the visible church even to this very day! How little of the genuine fruits of righteousness grow upon it! Human nature is propense to multiply crimes as God multiplies his favours, and a fruitful and a good estate or a flourishing trade commonly occasions more pride, sensuality, and impiety. They who attempt to share their hearts between God and mammon will surely be found faulty and condemned as hypocrites, for we should give the Lord the whole, and then love others for his sake and according to his commandment, and so love him in all and do all to his glory. Every idolized dependence will soon be torn from those who fear not God, and what indeed could a king or even a kingdom do for those who have him for their enemy? Hypocrisy, perjury, or treachery in oaths and covenants convert the most sacred observances into the vilest crimes and corrupt the very fountain of law and justice. They who rejoice in iniquity prepare terror and sorrow for themselves, for all created glories are transient and soon depart, pass into other hands and leave those ashamed who confided in them. All earthly prosperity is but a collection of bubbles, and is soon destroyed like the foam upon the water, and soon will haughty sinners call upon the rocks and mountains to hide them from the face of that angry judge, whom they now despise, when he speaks to them in the mild language of a merciful saviour. In every age, even in the visible church, we meet with those who copy and emulate the crimes and infamy of the most atrocious sinners of ancient times, nor can any judgments on earth so extirpate the children of iniquity that none shall be found who do evil and stand to it. But the Lord will punish all such, and their sins will form those chains in which they shall be bound and delivered up into the hands of their enemies. They who love only the privileges of the gospel or the temporal advantages of a religious profession and do not love to draw in the yoke of evangelical obedience and will not be induced to it by fatherly corrections, must expect to meet with severe treatment. And such, as refuse the liberty of God's service, must fall into the drudgery and oppression of Satan and their own lusts. However men may deceive themselves, it is most certain that, accordingly as a man sows, so also shall he reap, and, though our sowing unto righteousness is not deserving of a reward, yet it will abound to our own account, and we shall reap in mercy." Men should then be exhorted to break up the fallow ground of their hearts, that they may be prepared to receive the seed of God's word, and to give it root and nourishment, that it may produce an abundant increase. It is time that sinners entered upon this, for none can tell how soon the seed time may be lost, and the hopes of the harvest gone for ever. And though the Lord alone can come and rain righteousness upon us, yet it is our duty to use all means, in spiritual as well as in natural things. As for those who plough wickedness and reap iniquity in their unjust gains or forbidden pleasures, they will soon eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. Nor can their confidence in their own abilities, or in the multitude of the mighty, or the renowned who are of their mind, protect them against the wrath of God. Alas, what exquisite miseries do men's sins bring upon them, even in this world! Are nations rendered a scene of tumult and bloodshed? Are strongholds spoiled, and women and children murdered? Are kings cut off, and their subjects enslaved? Sin alone hath done all this mischief, and these are but a small specimen of its dreadful triumphs. Let us then look to and be thankful for the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. 
Chapter 11 Israel's ingratitude to God for his benefits, verses 1 to 4, his judgments on them, verses 5 to 7, intimations of mercy, verses 8 to 11, Judah's fidelity contrasted with Israel's treachery, verse 12. Verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Verse 2. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. Verse 3. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. Verse 4. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. Verse 5. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refused to return. Verse 6. And the sword shall abide on his cities, and shall consume his branches, and devour them, because of their own counsels. Verse 7. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Verse 8. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? Shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee at Zeboim? Mine heart is turned within me, my repentings are kindled together. Verse 9. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger, I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Verse 10. They shall walk after the Lord, he shall roar like a lion when he shall roar and the people shall tremble from the west. Verse 11, They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt, and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. Verse 12, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. Notes Verse 1 In the infancy of the nation, when Israel was weak and enslaved in Egypt, the Lord manifested his special love of him, acknowledged him for his son, and called him out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and Aaron. As this was typical of the true Israel's conversion from the bondage of sin and Satan to the liberty of God's children through his peculiar love to them, so it also prefigured the bringing up of the only begotten Son of God out of Egypt, whither he had been driven by Herod's cruelty, that he might, in the Lord's land, perform the whole work of our redemption." Note Matthew 2, verses 13 to 15. This prophecy is applied by St. Matthew to our Lord's return out of Egypt, and the literal sense of the words does more properly belong to him than to Israel, which is observable in many other prophecies, which can but improperly be applied to those of whom they were first spoken, and taking them in their true and genuine sense are only fulfilled in Christ. Verse 2. The perverse and ungrateful Israelites, after their deliverance, refused to hearken to the Lord's prophets, who called them to cleave to his service, nay, they were rather impelled by resentment and enmity to more decided rebellion and apostasy, and to run into various kinds of idolatry. In like manner the Jews afterwards walked contrary to the preaching of Christ and his apostles. Verses 3-4 the Lord had all along treated Israel, even the revolted ten tribes, with the tenderness of a nursing mother to her young child. He upheld them from falling, carried them above their difficulties, and taught them how they ought to walk in order to please him, as a mother doth teach her child to go, leading it by the arms. He had also healed their breaches and afflictions, though they did not know or thankfully acknowledge him as their healer. Indeed, he still drew them towards him, not by those violent methods which are used with brutes, but by such cogent arguments, such tender persuasions, such constraining motives and obligations, as were suited to work on the understanding, will, and affections of rational creatures. Especially his continued love towards them was suited to draw them to repentance, confidence, and obedience, for he not only plentifully provided for their wants, but carefully removed every impediment to their comfortable enjoyment of his bounty, as the husbandman takes off the yoke and unmuzzles the ox, which hath finished his labour, as well as lays the provender before him. Verses 5-7 to seven. The Israelites had a strong attachment to Egypt. They would not, however, be sent back as a nation to that house of bondage, though many individuals fled thither, but the Assyrian king would acquire the dominion over them. 
seeing they refused to return to the worship of Jehovah, and his authority would be that of the sword, abiding on and desolating their cities and villages, and devouring the inhabitants. This would be the effect of their own counsel in refusing submission to the Assyrians, and in seeking help from the Egyptians. Though they were called the Lord's people, they were bent to backslide or apostatize from him. This was the constant bias of their minds, and they were obstinate in it, so that, though the prophets earnestly called them to the worship of the Most High God, none of them would exalt or honor him, but all of them preferred their worthless idols to him. Bent to, etc. My people are in suspense because of their backsliding from me. Either they are in continual anxiety because of God's displeasure, or they are irresolute and halt between God and their idols. Loath. Perhaps the invitation which Hezekiah sent to the ten tribes to come and join in celebrating the Passover may be alluded to. Verses 8 to 11. Strict justice demanded that Israel should be rendered as Adma and Zeboim, which were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah by fire from heaven, so that none escaped, and the place where they had stood was rendered ever after a monument of divine vengeance. But mercy objected to this righteous severity. For how could the Lord give up his Israel to such universal and dire destruction? Speaking after the manner of men, his bowels were moved, and his heart pained and even turned within him at the thought, so that his repentings, or disposition to relent and mitigate the sentence, were excited along with his holy indignation. He would not therefore execute the fierceness of his anger in so undistinguishing a manner, nor return by one stroke after another, utterly to destroy Ephraim. For, being God and not man, of infinite perfection in wisdom and mercy as well as in justice and holiness, he knew how to moderate and regulate his indignation, and to glorify all his attributes in his dealings with them. He had dwelt in the midst of them, as the Holy One of Israel, and it would not consist with his glory to destroy them as he had done Sodom, without leaving any remnant, or to make them perpetual desolations. He would not enter Samaria, or their other cities, in this tremendous anger. Some of the people should survive the catastrophe and be incorporated among the Jews, or otherwise be brought into the church, who in future times would walk after the Lord, when his terrible and powerful voice should be heard among them, as the roaring of a lion, Israel in after times would tremble throughout their dispersions, like the birds of the air, or the dove the most timid of them, and, being thus brought to fear and to submit to him, they would be reinstated in the church, and perhaps in their own land. This evidently looks forward to the future conversion and restoration of Israel, as well as to the times subsequent to the Babylonish captivity, and to the days of Christ and his apostles. Verse 12. The religious professions and services of Israel were lies and hypocrisy, with which they compassed and offended God. But in Judah the princes wrought with God and ruled for him, and, as regard was paid to his laws, they had great influence with him, and the people were faithful with the saints, or followers of their pious progenitors. This was probably written at the time of Hezekiah's reformation, and was an intimation of his deliverance from Sennacherib's invasion. Practical Observations The care of the Lord over us, from our earliest infancy, should induce us to grateful obedience and holy worship, and it will tend to our condemnation if it have not this effect. But his love to his church of redeemed sinners from the beginning, and especially in giving his Son to become incarnate, and to pass through hardships and sufferings, from his birth in the stable to his death upon the cross, should principally encourage our hopes and engage our affections to him. Yet, alas, many who are favoured with abundant means of becoming acquainted with this love of God our Saviour, turn away from him, as if he were an enemy, and prefer their lusts and idols to his unsearchable riches and unspeakable kindness. They, indeed, alone are truly happy, whom he teaches by his Spirit, upholds by his power, and causes to walk in his ways. They do not always know at first to whom they are indebted for these beginnings of healing and salvation, but they will at length acknowledge him as the author and finisher of that blessed work. He neither finds sinners willing to be saved in his humbling holy method, nor does he force salvation upon them against their wills, but he draws them in the most rational, tender, and persuasive manner, rendering his arguments, warnings, motives, and encouragements efficacious to the influences of his Holy Spirit. In the Gospel he sets his rich provisions before them, 
and by his grace he takes away prejudice, pride, the carnal mind, and the love and dominion of sin, and creates an appetite for the blessed feast, and so they feed and live for ever. But they, who have only outward advantages, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth them to repentance, proceed with a hard and impenitent heart to treasure up wrath against the approaching day of wrath. For miseries in various forms await those who refuse to return to God, and their own counsels serve only to bring ruin upon them. But alas, how bent to backsliding are even God's professing people! Notwithstanding the labours of ministers to call people to the service of the Most High, there are but few who cordially honour him, and give him the throne in their hearts. So that he might justly give up even a great part of the visible church, as he did Adma and Zeboim. Nay, it is of his mercy that we are not all consumed. But his compassions are free and infinite, he pities the miseries, forgives the sins, moderates the corrections of his offending people, and seems to repent of his severity towards them. How then should we repent of our ingratitude to him? He will not destroy his church, nor leave his enemies to triumph, for he is the unchangeable God, and not like mutable man, and he can execute vengeance on hypocrites, and correct his offending children, without inflicting his fierce anger by an indiscriminate destruction. But whilst this Holy One, who deigns to dwell in the midst of his church, roars like a lion against all the workers of iniquity, true Israelites tremble before him, but do not flee from him. Thus, fearing his wrath, confessing their guilt, and trusting in his mercy, they will be restored to the enjoyment of his favour, and will have the tokens of his acceptance, whilst the deceits and lies of hypocrites shall be exposed and punished. It is peculiarly honourable to him when we obey his commands, serve him in our respective places, and are faithful amongst his saints, in times of general apostasy, and them who thus honour God, he will honour, but such as despise him shall be lightly esteemed. Chapter 12. Ephraim and Judah reproved, verses 1 and 2. The conduct of the nation exposed, by comparison with that of their pious ancestor Jacob, whom God especially favoured, and a call to repentance, verses 3 to 6. Ephraim's crimes and ingratitude provoke God to punish him, verses 7 to 14. Verse 1. Ephraim feedeth on wind, and followeth after the east wind. He daily increaseth lies and desolation, and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried into Egypt. Verse 2. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings will he recompense him. Verse 3. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Verse 4. Yea, he had power over the angel, and prevailed. He wept, and made supplication unto him, and he found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Verse 5, Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Verse 6, Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. Verse 7, He is a merchant, the balances of deceit are in his hand, he loveth to oppress. Verse 8, And Ephraim said, Yet am I become rich, I have found me out substance, in all my labours they shall find none iniquity in me that was sin. Verse 9, And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. Verse 10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Verse 11. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity, they sacrifice bullocks in Gilgal, yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. Verse 12. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. Verse 13, And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Verse 14, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly, therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. Notes Verses 1 and 2 Israel acted as foolishly in seeking help from idols and idolaters as a man would do who should seek to satisfy his hunger by greedily pursuing the noxious east wind which could only disappoint him. But indeed they continually multiplied delusions which served to increase their desolations, for after having made a treaty with the Assyrians they violated it, sending quantities of oil into Egypt to purchase the assistance of that people in shaking off the Assyrian yoke. Indeed, the Lord had also a controversy with Judah in this matter, though they adhered to the family of David and the priesthood of Aaron, and did not publicly commit idolatry, 
yet they were prone to form heathen alliances instead of wholly trusting in God. For this he intended to punish them, in a manner suitable to the offence, which he afterwards did by Sennacherib's invasion, though he did not give them up to the Assyrians as he did the ten tribes. Verses 3-6 to six. Having mentioned Jacob, including the whole nation descended from that patriarch, the prophet showed how contrary their conduct in trusting to an arm of flesh was to that of their believing progenitor, as a token that he would afterwards struggle hard for the birthright and the blessing of God, he even in the womb took his brother by the heel, as if contending for the privilege of primogeniture, and afterwards, being strong in faith, he had power as a prince with God, when he prevailed with him for deliverance from the armed force of his enraged brother. He was at that time in no condition to resist, and he had no place to flee unto, yet he sought no other succour than that of God but he wrestled with him, and had power over him, whom Moses called a man, as he appeared in human form, but who was the angel of God's presence, the eternal Son of God, yea, God with whom by his strength he prevailed, and he would not depart until he blessed him. His wrestling was only the sign of that spiritual conflict by which he obtained this honourable victory, even fervent prayer, for he wept for the sins that had first enraged his brother's anger, and for the sorrows with which he was then oppressed, and made supplication to him even to the angel for deliverance from his brother. Notes Genesis 32. This very person called a man by Moses, who yet records that the name of the place was called Peniel, or the face of God, and by Hosea, God and the angel, yea, the Lord God of hosts, found Jacob at Bethel, and there spake to him, and to his remotest posterity with him. And who could this be, to whom these several titles belonged, but he who, appearing then in the form of God, afterwards took on the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of a man? The Lord spake twice to Jacob in Bethel, but the first time especially seems intended, when God appeared from above the ladder to him, as he lay asleep beneath, having fled from the face of Esau, when God gave most gracious promises to him and his posterity, when Jacob called the place Bethel, or the house of God, and made a solemn vow to him. Afterwards he appeared to him at Peniel, and at length again he sent him to Bethel, to pay his vow that he had made in the day of his distress. But his descendants, regardless of all vows, warnings, and obligations, set up even at Bethel their golden calf, and turned that house of God into a house of vanity by their vile idolatry. Yet it was the Lord of hosts, or armies, which Jacob had met with in these places, who was to be known by that memorial to all generations, and he was as able to deliver them as he had been to deliver their ancestor, so that they needed not seek help from an arm of flesh. Let them therefore turn to him, and keep mercy and judgment, or righteousness, and wait on God continually, and they should at length experience his power, mercy, and truth, as Jacob had done. The Jews did this in some measure under Hezekiah, and were marvellously delivered from Sennacherib, but the Israelites, who entirely neglected it, were soon destroyed by Shalmaneser. Verses 7 to 9 Ephraim prospered by becoming a merchant. The word signifies a Canaanite. The Israelites conducted trade upon Canaanitish principles, covetously and iniquitously, using false balances, cheating by various artifices, and loving to oppress the poor. Thus they grew rich, and they supposed that providence favoured and approved of them. They ascribed their wealth to their own industry, and thought it a substantial advantage, and, though the prophets might condemn them, they were satisfied that they could not be detected in any iniquitous methods of growing rich, which could properly be called sin or deserve the wrath of God. What was not absolutely to be justified might at least be executed. But the Lord, who as their God had so favoured them, even from their deliverance from Egypt, would drive them from their stately houses to dwell in mean and movable tents as wanderers among the nations, even such tents as were used on the days of the solemn feast of tabernacles. Some indeed interpret this of future mercies in reserve for Israel, notwithstanding their sins, and suppose that the joy of the feast of tabernacles is referred to. Zechariah 14 verses 16 to 19. Verses 10 and 11. The varied means which the Lord had employed by the ministry of his prophets from age to age greatly aggravated Israel's crimes. They had used parables, illustrations, and similitudes to explain and enforce their messages, but all to no purpose. It is probable that this was written some time after the inhabitants of Gilead had been carried captive by Tiglath-Pileser. 
2 Kings 15 verse 29, Do ye think that there was more iniquity in the Gileadites that are already carried away captive than in you? Surely the rest of Israel is in the same case. They all lie open to the same judgment. They sacrifice to their idols in Gilgal also. Bishop Hall. In short, their altars were as numerous as the heaps of dung laid on the ploughed field, or of stones gathered out of it. Verses 12 to 14. The people ought to have remembered the low condition of their progenitor, as well as his plain, honest, industrious character, and his pious confidence in God. When he went into Mesopotamia, or the country between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris, he was so destitute, yet so diligent and skilful, that he laid the foundation of his future provision, and even of his family. By serving fourteen years as a shepherd for his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and cheerfully enduring hardship all that time, from which low original all their subsequent prosperity arose, and surely they ought not to despise the prophets, when the Lord by his prophet Moses brought the nation out of Egypt, and preserved them from the destructive rage of Pharaoh. But they had most bitterly provoked his anger by despising his prophets and abusing his goodness. They should therefore perish in their sins, with their blood upon their own heads, and he would turn upon them the contempt and reproach which they had cast on him and his servants. Some think that the passage is connected with the preceding verse in this manner, Jacob fled to Gilead from Mesopotamia, where he had been a servant and fed Laban's sheep, for his wives, etc., and God by his prophet Moses led Israel to Gilead, when he delivered them from Egyptian bondage, yet the inhabitants of Gilead, which had been thus distinguished, were carried away captive, and could Ephraim expect to escape? Mahanaim, where the angel met Jacob, as returned to Canaan, was in the land of Gilead, Genesis 32, verse 2. To Samuel 17 verses 26 and 27, and Peniel, where he wrestled with God and prevailed, lay in that neighborhood. Note verses 3 to 6, Judges 8 verses 8 and 9. Practical observations verses 1 to 6. They who depend on creatures for safety or felicity, whilst the wrath of God abideth on them, feed on wind and follow after the east wind, and the increase of their delusions enhances their miseries. Such, as in some things deserve commendation, are in others to be blamed, and the Lord has many a controversy even with his saints, who are visited with rebukes and corrections according to their doings. We should be followers of the most eminent believers in their most simple dependence on God, their fervency and persevering prayer, and their most unreserved obedience. We should select for our imitation the most distinguished parts of their conduct, in which they are mentioned with most honour, and most evidently prevailed with God by their strength of faith and humble expectation. If we have power with the great angel of the covenant, and lay hold of him and his salvation by vigorous faith, whatever our foes or fears may suggest, or however our sins and sorrows may cause us to join tears with our supplications, we shall certainly have power with God, for he and the Father are one. He is the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial, he hath all hearts in his hands, and he can easily cause our most malignant enemies to be at peace with us. Let us then cease from man, and set ourselves to wrestle with him, for the blessing, determined never to give over, till we prevail. Let us seek him in his ordinances, and hear him speak to us, by all his promises and precepts, to his ancient servants. And may we be enabled to turn to him as our portion, to keep and execute judgment and mercy towards all men, and to wait on our God continually." Verses 7 to 14. In general, they who neglect piety are exceedingly defective in their moral conduct, and lawful, honourable, and useful, as commerce must be allowed to be, when properly conducted, yet too many called Christians are mere Canaanites in this respect. The balances of deceit are in their hands, and they love to oppress. They think every measure satisfied by which men grow rich. They prosper in the world, ascribe it to their own prudence, and spend their wealth upon themselves and if they can keep up their credit with men, or excuse themselves by the maxims and customs of the commercial world, or of others in their own line of trade, their consciences are satisfied. Their deviations are trivial and justifiable, they are not worthy to be called transgressors against God, and such as condemn them are uncharitable enthusiasts, or men that know nothing of the world. But however God may wink at such things, in the days and places of total ignorance, he will assuredly mark and punish them in those who profess his truth and frequent his ordinances, 
and who have been favoured with the multiplied visions and similitudes of the prophets by the parables of Christ, the instructions of his apostles, and the stated ministry of the word. Iniquity in such places is peculiarly hateful, and it is often connected with idolatry, superstition, hypocrisy, or open impiety. It is better to endure the hardest labour in the lowest menial situation, under poverty and oppression, than to grow rich by sin, and we shall best form a judgment of our own conduct by comparing it with that of ancient believers, in their approved actions and in similar circumstances. None will despise prophesyings, but they who know not what things God hath in former ages done for his church by the ministry of his prophets, and he still honours and works by his faithful ministers, who endeavour by every means to bring his people acquainted with his truth and will. All, therefore, who despise them, despise him that sent them, and provoke him to anger most bitterly. They will perish with their blood upon their own heads, except they repent of this their wickedness, and the Lord will cause the reproach cast on him to return and rest upon them. Chapter 13. The glory of Ephraim was about to end in dreadful judgments for his idolatry and ingratitude to God, verses 1 to 8. Promises of mercy and redemption from the grave, verses 9 to 14. The desolation of Samaria foretold, verses 15 to 16. Verse 1. When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. Verse 2. And now they sin more and more, and they have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Verse 3, Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. Verse 4, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Saviour besides me. Verse 5, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. Verse 6, According to their pasture, so were they filled, they were filled, and their heart was exalted, and therefore have they forgotten me. Verse 7, Therefore I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way will I observe them. Verse 8, I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, and will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Verse 10. I will be thy king, where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judges, of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princes. Verse 11. I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in my wrath. Verse 12, The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hid. Verse 13, The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. Verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues, O grave, I will be thy destruction repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Verse 15. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Verse 16. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. Notes. Verses 1 and 2. When Ephraim was little in his own estimation, and spake in a humble, diffident manner of himself, and when he feared the Lord, trembled at his word, or lest he should offend him and forfeit his protection, he then grew considerable in Israel. Joshua, the conqueror of Canaan, descended from Ephraim, and from his time that tribe gained the ascendancy in the northern parts of the land, and preserved it till Jeroboam, an Ephraimite, became king of Israel, and then the kingdom of the ten cities was frequently called Ephraim. But when Ahab and the succeeding kings set up the worship of Baal, this prosperity declined, and the kingdom in general, and the tribe in particular, became like a criminal condemned to die, or a man languishing under a mortal disease. Yet nothing could induce the people to renounce idolatry. The word rendered trembling occurs in no other place. Some interpret the clause of Jeroboam, a descendant of Ephraim, speaking words suited to excite horror when he commanded the worship of the golden calves, 
in order to his own exaltation and that of his family in Israel. When Jehu had destroyed Baal, they adhered to the golden calves and lavished their treasures, and employed their ingenuity in framing other idols. And when these were taken from them, they made others in their stead. The kings and priests and other zealous worshippers required those who brought sacrifices to kiss the calves. By a peculiar arrangement, the word for men is, in the original, next to that for calves. The sacrifices, man, the calves shall kiss. That man, Adam, whom God made in his own image and likeness, nay, man favoured with the oracles of God, should degrade himself by kissing, as an act of adoration and love, the lifeless image of a mean brute, is a wonderful proof of stupidity and depravity. Thus Cicero describes the statue of Hercules as having its mouth and chin worn something smoother, because they, the worshippers, used not only to adore it with prayers and thanksgivings, but also to kiss it. Some render it, let the sacrifices of men kiss the calves, but it does not appear that human sacrifices were offered in the worship of the calves. Verses 3 and 4. To punish these abominable idolatries, the state of Ephraim, like his goodness, 6 verse 4, would be as the morning cloud, the early dew, the chaff before the whirlwind, or the smoke out of the chimney, i.e. violently and speedily made to vanish and disappear. For after all that the Lord had done for Israel, from their deliverance out of Egypt, they ought to have acknowledged and worshipped no other god but him alone, for none but he was or could be a saviour or deliverer of his people from temporal or eternal ruin. Notes Isaiah 43 verses 9 to 13. This may also be understood as a prophecy of what the Lord would do for them in future times. Verses 5 to 8. The Lord had acknowledged, regarded, and provided for Israel in the wilderness, when otherwise they must have perished by thirst, because it was a land of great drought. Yet when they entered Canaan and were like cattle placed in a good pasture, they gratified their appetites to excess, and their hearts were lifted up in pride. This caused them to forget God and their obligations to Him, and so they apostatized to gross idolatry. Therefore He would meet them in vengeance with the fierceness of a leopard, that watches by the way to seize upon the travellers, with the fury of a savage bear, enraged by the loss of her young, with the force of a lion, or as the most terrible beast that inhabited their forests. They never venture to fire on a young bear when the mother is near, for if the cub drop, she becomes enraged to a degree little short of madness, and if she gets sight of the enemy, will only quit her revenge with her life. Cook's Voyage Verse 9. One hath destroyed thee, O Israel, that is, thou art destroyed. Thou shouldst have trusted in me for thy help, but having forsaken me, thou art destroyed. Israel did not trust in God for help, and Sennacherib triumphed over them. Hezekiah and Judah did trust in God for help, and were delivered from him. This seems the construction and sense of this verse, and the meaning is nearly the same as in our translation. O Israel, one hath destroyed thee, but in me is thy help. Israel need not blame others for his ruin, for he had destroyed himself, but he could not save himself, his help was in and from God alone. Verses 10 and 11. The Lord had all along undertaken to be Israel's king and protector, and the judges whom he raised up delivered the people by his authority and immediate help. But where was there any that could save them in all their cities, or of all their rulers, whom they set up for themselves? In the time of Samuel they would have a king, and God in anger granted their rebellious request, and gave them Saul, who both during his life and at his death was the occasion of great calamities to them. And similar had been the case with the kings of Israel, from Jeroboam's revolt to the ruin of the kingdom of the ten tribes by the death of Hoshea their last king. This last event seems especially alluded to. I will give thee a king in mine anger, and take him away in my wrath. Verses 12 and 13. The nation had accumulated wickedness from age to age, which was, as it were, bound up in bags and laid by in a secure place to be produced against the day of account. The affairs of the nation were coming to a crisis as the hour of travail approaches to the pregnant woman and her sorrows can in no wise be avoided. But the event would be that of a woman who dies without being delivered, for the people would make no more efforts to rescue themselves from their difficulties than a dead child could do. They were so foolish that they continued in a situation which must certainly end in ruin without attempting any reformation or repentance, 
so that the souls of individuals and the state of the nation would perish together, like the mother and child in the case alluded to. They ought indeed to use endeavours most earnestly, without delay, to extricate themselves before it was too late, but they foolishly neglected or postponed every means. Verse 14. The predictions of the ruin of Israel as a nation were connected with an intimation of a merciful and powerful interposition of God to save a remnant of them, as from death and the grave, yet this was but a shadow of the ransom of the true Israel by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ from the wrath of God, the death of sin, the power of Satan, and finally from death and the grave itself at the last day. When Christ died and was buried and rose again, he, as it were, disquieted the dominions of death, and was the plague of that king of terrors, and at last he will be the destruction of both death and the grave. This was absolutely determined, and would certainly be accomplished, notwithstanding Israel's sins and miseries. The Lord would not repent of this, his purpose and promise. He would not even hide repentance from his eyes, as determined not to look at it. The Septuagint renders the middle clauses, Where is thy vengeance, O death? Where is thy sting, O grave? Or, O hell? And the Apostle seems to have thus understood the passage, though he does not quote it exactly, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55. The word translated, I will be, is rendered in many versions, where, both here and in the tenth verse, where is thy king, and only the transposition of a single letter is requisite fully to authorize this construction. Verses 15 and 16. Though Ephraim, whose name signifies fruitfulness, had been so fruitful in respect of the numbers of the people, yet he would certainly be destroyed by the Assyrians, whom the Lord would send against him, as the east wind from the wilderness blights the spreading tree, or as when the springs from beneath dry up and it withers for lack of moisture. Thus his fountain would be dried up, and his treasures, and choice vessels of precious metal and rich furniture would be spoiled. For when the land had previously been ravaged, Samaria would be desolated by the most inhuman murder even of the women and children. Practical Observations, verses 1 to 8 Humility with the fear of God and a dependence on His mercy, truth, and power forms the grand requisite for honor and advancement in the service of Israel's God and King. But they who exalt themselves shall be abased, and such as forsake God to follow idols and iniquities give a fatal wound to their own prosperity, and are the murderers of their own souls. The way of transgression is downhill, and they who begin to descend often sin on more and more, till they come into the pit of destruction. Many would spare no expense in religion, provided it might be regulated according to their own understanding, to suit their own inclinations, and not according to the word of God. In this case they would adore the work of the craftsman, or the creature of their own imagination, with abundant reverence, devotion, and affection, and with as much stupidity as the Israelites prostrated themselves before, and kissed the dead image of a calf. But every fleeting object in nature might preach to such men the vanity of their religion, and the transient continuance of their prosperity. Surely no one who has read the Bible should acknowledge any other God than Him from whom cometh our salvation and they who have experienced the power of converting grace and have walked with God in the liberty of the gospel will be effectually preserved from such delusions, for none can be entitled to our worship who cannot save us from all enemies and evils, and there is no other Saviour but the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, into whose name Christians are baptized. He takes care of his people in their lowest estate and preserves them in every barren desert and land of drought through which they pass." But when sinners, under terror of conscience, or in difficult circumstances, obtain ease or prosperity, and then run into excess, are lifted up in pride, or lulled into carnal security, and so forget the Lord, they may expect to be punished with marked severity. This ingratitude, so natural to fallen man, excites his heaviest indignation, and turns his kindness into jealousy, which burns most fiercely against the objects of it. He can torture the inmost soul, and, as it were, rend the call of the heart, of his rebellious and apostate worshippers. Nor can words describe or similitudes illustrate the anguish which he can excite in the heart and conscience. Verses 9 to 16. We have all destroyed ourselves, and should never so speak of God's purposes, or Satan's temptations, or any other subject, as to forget that our own willful apostasy and rebellion have exposed us to that deserved wrath which must have terminated in eternal ruin, had not mercy intervened. 
nor can we have any help but from the Lord, and, blessed be his name, in him is effectual help, and for us, if we are willing to accept of it. All things are now ready, the mercies of God are infinite, his redemption all-sufficient, his invitations free and unencumbered, his promises exceedingly great and precious, his wisdom, power, and truth are concerned to accomplish them to every believer. He will be the king, the protector, and ruler of all who believe, and he will save them completely and forever. But all other schemes for obtaining safety and eternal life are as vain as Israel's hope in their kings and judges, whom they rebelliously set up, when they rejected the Lord and would not have him to reign over them. What we inordinately desire will perhaps be given us in anger, and whether granted or withheld or taken from us will be the occasions of wrath and tribulation to our souls. The sins of unbelievers, with all their aggravations, are laid up in the omniscience of God, as if hid among his treasures, and who can conceive what a long and heavy account there stands out against each person? Except, therefore, sinners repent and believe the gospel, anguish will soon come upon them, as the sorrows of a travailing woman, from which there will be no deliverance. He is then most unwise, who doth not make haste to flee from the wrath to come. For however men may be alarmed and affected, unless they enter in at the straight gate, and become penitent believers, new created in Christ Jesus under good works, they will as surely perish as the child does, whose mother's womb becomes its grave. But the great Redeemer is able and willing to extricate those that call upon him, out of this and every difficulty. He hath paid the ransom of our souls with his blood, and begun his triumphs by his resurrection from the dead, and all who accept and bring forth the fruits of his salvation may be assured that he will also ransom them from the power of the grave, and redeem them from death, until he hath forced the devouring monster to disgorge his prey, until he has become the destruction of the grave, and mortality be swallowed up of life. Then will the millions of the redeemed rejoice and praise the Lord for having destroyed the last enemy and for having restored them, in body and soul, to a glorious immortality. These are true and faithful sayings, for the Lord hath promised, and repentance will be hid from his eyes. But without fruitfulness in good works springing from the Spirit of Christ, all other fruitfulness will be found as empty and as the uncertain riches of the world. The wrath of God will wither its branches, the springs that watered it shall become dry, and it shall be spoiled and come to nothing. In short, tribulation and anguish belong to those who have rebelled against God, and their woes will be far more terrible than any that are experienced in that cruelty and carnage which often attend the storming of populous cities. From such miseries and murders, and from sin, the fruitful parent of all sorrow, good Lord, we beseech thee to deliver us. Chapter 14 Calls to Repentance, verses 1 to 3, Promises of Peculiar Blessings to Israel, verses 4 to 8, These Things Worthy of Peculiar Attention, verse 9. Verse 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Verse 2. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Verse 3. Ashur shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Verse 4. I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Verse 5. I will be as the dew unto Israel, he shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Verse 6. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. Verse 7. They that dwell under his shadow shall return, they shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Verse 8. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Verse 9. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Notes. Verses 1 to 3. This chapter is very different from the general tenor of the preceding prophecy, and perhaps it was delivered after the reduction of Samaria and the ruin of the kingdom of Israel. Some penitents might be found among the scattered remnant who would need encouragement. 
others might be brought to repentance by means of their afflictions and these exhortations and promises imply predictions of future events to the nation of israel and to the church of god israel is here exhorted to return to the lord jehovah had always been known as their god and they might expect all blessings from him by virtue of the covenant made with their fathers they must renounce their sins and idols by true repentance by faith in his mercy and grace through the promised redeemer and by diligently attending on his worship and service thus they would be recovered from that ruined state into which they had fallen by their iniquities and idolatries in order to this they must take not legal sacrifices but words expressive of the desires of their hearts and with them address the lord in order to guide their prayers the prophet showed them what words suited their case they must first entreat god to take away all iniquity conscious that they could neither expiate nor subdue their sins and beseech him to receive them graciously to take them of his rich mercy into his family and to confer on them all the blessings of salvation or take good that is all good things to bestow upon us psalm sixty eight verse eighteen ephesians four verse eighteen then with their lips they would proclaim his praise and give him the whole glory of their salvation rendering him sacrifices of thanksgiving far more acceptable than the calves of the stall at the same time they must renounce their former heathen alliances and idolatries and every carnal confidence and profess that they would no more have recourse to the assyrians or attempt to multiply horses from egypt in order to resist their foes that they would no more adore as gods the work of their own hands or expect help from their idols but that they would come to the lord believing him to be always ready to relieve the destitute the friendless the helpless and unworthy the whole forms an important description of the nature and tendency of a sinner's conversion to god through jesus christ verses four to eight these verses contain promises in answer to the preceding prayers whenever israel should be excited to present them god would heal israel's backsliding or their manifold apostasies and idolatries the word signifies aversion or enmity he would recall them from their wanderings pardon their guilt subdue their evil propensities speak peace to their consciences renew their souls and establish them in holiness and all this would flow from his free unmerited mercy and favour thus he would show that his righteous anger was turned from them and that he was perfectly reconciled then he would be to them as refreshing fructifying dew which silently distils on the plants and flowers all over the earth israel would become a holy people growing rapidly like a lily which is noted for its beautiful whiteness yet as this was only a fading flower he would also send abroad his roots like a cedar in lebanon his branches would become spreading and beautiful as those of the olive tree and the savour of his graces would resemble the smell of the odiferous plants of lebanon thus he would be a most stately fruitful and delightful tree uniting the greatest variety of excellencies multitudes from all parts of the earth would come to dwell under his shadow and be converted to the lord being thus revived from the death of sin and misery the people would grow up to maturity as the corn ripens for the harvest they would bear fruit as the vine and be as delightful to all around them as the celebrated wines made from the vineyards on the sides of mount lebanon which at this day are most excellent then ephraim who had been joined to idols would be effectually divorced from them he would speak as one ashamed of ever having worshipped them and renounce them with indignation and abhorrence and the lord in infinite mercy would hear his prayers and confessions he observed that ephraim was at length become humble and penitent and he was ready to give grace and speak peace he would be to him like a green fir tree large beautiful and shady in him ephraim would find all things needful for safety and comfort and from him would proceed all the pleasant effects of his repentance and faith and all the sanctifying fruits in his life the passage seems to predict the conversion of the jews and incorporated israelites to christ in the apostolic times and also the future conversion of that people the exquisitely beautiful poetry of these verses has excited the warm admiration of all competent judges verse nine the due understanding and improvement of these directions and encouragements would be a proof of wisdom and prudence and every wise and prudent man in the things of god would certainly thus know and improve them the dealings of the lord with his people the doctrines of his word and the requirements of his law 
The ways by which men come to him and walk with him, and the paths in which he walks towards them, are all right, holy, just, wise, merciful, and faithful. This, the righteous, the penitent believer, perceives and comes to walk with God in them, but obstinate transgressors, or those who prevaricate, stumble at every part of his word, and pervert the whole to the increase of their impiety and presumptuous wickedness, and thus they are ensnared and perish, even by means of those things which in themselves are most excellent and divine. Practical Observations Sin is the prolific parent of all the misery in the universe, and we should trace all our sorrows to this source. Blessed be God, in this world we may be recovered. How low soever we be fallen by our iniquity, for we are called on to return to the Lord our God, as in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, and when by faith we obey this call, we are raised up from the brink of despair and hell, reinstated in the full favour of God, and taught to rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. The words which flow from a contrite heart are far more pleasing to God than ten thousands of bullocks and rams, as being uniformly connected with a disposition to look unto the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. We should not, therefore, under any distresses, even when we have fallen by iniquity, turn away from God, but rather turn to Him, as our only refuge and salvation. We should first beseech Him to teach us what to ask and how to ask, and when the words of the Holy Spirit correspond with our desires, we should take them with us and present them before the Lord, that it may be done unto us according to them. We must especially be earnest with Him to take away all our iniquity. If that is pardoned, we are happy, as nothing but sin can prevent our receiving all good from our gracious God, and surely the whole glory of our salvation, and every possible expression of praise and gratitude, are justly due to our merciful Deliverer, and we can never refuse Him the cheap but honourable sacrifice of the calves of our lips. But the true penitent will also evince his sincerity by renouncing his former sins and carnal confidences. He does not want these sources of satisfaction or such refuges of lies, since he has learnt to trust in the tender love and compassion of that God in whom the fatherless findeth mercy, and who withholds no good thing from them that walk uprightly. They who thus come before God will surely find him ready to heal their backslidings, how great and many soever they have been. He will love them freely and turn away all his indignation from them. He will refresh their souls with the dew of his grace. He will render them holy, amiable, steadfast, fruitful, and useful, and others will repair to them and grow up into the experience and fruitfulness of the gospel through their converse, example, and prayers. Thus the cause of God revives in one place or another from time to time. Believers ripen for heaven or grow more serviceable on earth. God is glorified, the church is increased, and sinners saved. Still the Lord waits to be gracious, and he observes with pleasure the broken-hearted penitent. He is ready to refresh every weary soul, and to make those joyful and fruitful who were most barren and disconsolate, for from him is all our fruit found. May he give us that wisdom and prudence which lead to the knowledge, experience, and practice of these things. May we learn to walk in the right ways of God, as his righteous servants, and may none of us, being disobedient and unbelieving, stumble at the word of his grace. 